Hello, I'm Dapper Dan Gavazdan, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, which definitely count. And I'm mischievous Mark Giannacchio, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals. But Dan, I'll tell you once, I'll tell you again, I'll tell you every single time we do one of these episodes, the annuals don't count. Well, I have no strong retort to that at the moment. So what I will say is thank you for joining us for the third episode of season six of the amazing spider talk, the show where two fans and collectors uncover the strange fun and fascinating history of the Spider-Man comic universe. If you want to swing along with us on our journey through Spidey's past, present and future, subscribe to amazing spider talk on your favorite podcast app. This podcast exists because of the support of our Patreon members. If you want to receive early episodes like these seasonal episodes, exclusive artwork, and help keep this podcast going, you can just go to AmazingSpiderTalk.com and you'll see a big button that says Patreon and it'll lead you to the rest. All it's up to you is to consider joining Patreon and uh, enjoying all the content we have to offer. And why would someone want to join Patreon, Dan? Because every episode of the season features artwork by comic artist Nick Cagnetti that is available to our Patreon members unlettered and in stunning high resolution. I mean, my goodness, look at this thing. It's like one of those 15-inch HDTVs, right? Or even better than that, yeah, I think. Yeah, so <laughs> sharp you'll maybe poke your eye out. Woo! But in this season of The Amazing Spider Talk, we're going back to the mid-80s when the Amazing Spider-Man title was handed over to one of the most legendary creative pairings in comics, who were just starting their creative partnership, Tom DeFalco and Ron Friends. It was a time of immense change in the comics industry, but together Tom and Ron returned Spider-Man to its Ditko-inspired roots to create one of the most beloved runs on the title. Yes, and today we are also returning to one of our favorite recurring topics each season of our show, the... Shall I, Dan? Uh, go for it, Mark. The bad guys. Uh, it's, it's, see, I'm out of practice. The bad guys. There we go. From the lows of the fool killer to the heights of Dr. Octopus, we are cataloging all of Spidey's major and minor foes as they are introduced in each era of our show. This time, we are talking about the villains of the DeFalco Friends run, many of which originated with inspiration from a deck of animal playing cards that... The two shared. The Puma, Silver Sable. I mean, that's kind of the end of the animals, but still there are more. Many more of these villains made memorable debuts and have managed to last the test of time. That famous deck of cards of which two villains would originate and are the title of our episode. Uh, maybe a bit of an anticlimax, but... <laughs> Let me get to the good part. A bad guys episode wouldn't be half as fun without inviting back our favorite brotherly duo in comics podcasting. So due to popular demand and so the fool killer won't come after us from being well foolish directly from the screw it. We're going to talk about comics podcast. It's Kevin and Will Hines. Uh, hey guys, thanks for having us back. This is Kevin speaking first. And this, and this is the similarly sounding Will speaking. Thanks for having that's, us. That's not going to be a problem at all for people to keep up with. <laughs> I mean, but uh, I hope we, not. we are very happy to have you. Yeah. How does that work out on your show? And I don't think people can tell us apart. It's just some weird unending monologue from from uh, each of you. <laughs> yeah, it just just sounds like one insane person who gets slightly more knowledgeable and then slightly dumber. And uh, you can't tell why. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's fun. We, and we love being guests on the show, so thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us back. As always, yeah, we're he... shamed by your preparation. Uh, I know you guys think you're not prepared, and maybe you're not. But compared to us, you are Kurt Busiek. Like, uh, you, <laughs> you, you've got everything ready to go. Well, that's very exciting. Uh, famously, on the last Bad Guys episode, uh, we all roundly criticized Mark for his love of the fool killer. And... Uh, I hope we can repeat some of that dynamic today, which is mostly just beating up on Mark. And, 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 um, and yet, if memory serves, the Fool Killer was eventually outranked by the Mad Thinker. So, like, let's just, like, you know, like, you know, you can, yeah. you can all gang up on me all you want. But, you know, at the end, you know I'm right. 
You know, like, like you just know I'm right. So anyway, I I, I refuse to agree with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> well, in one moment, a brief, brief moment of praise for Mark, I do want to throw it over to Mark to talk about what is the deal with this whole deck of animal cards that we are referring to. Um, tell us a little bit about this and the premise of why that's so associated with this episode of the show. Well, well, you know, Dan, way, way back in the day, I mean, you might even say you can find such a conversation in our amazing Spider Talk back issues feed. It was uh, during our co first conversation with the legendary Tom DeFalco. Uh, they discussed, you know, Tom discussed part of the creative process he had with Ron Friends. And one of them was like, oh, you know, when we were, we were trying to come up with some new villains and, and they were kind of looking for, for sources of inspiration. Whereas maybe, you know, I'm in my basement right now. I'm looking, I'm like, ooh, boiler pipe. Uh, ooh, NBA Jam mini arcade game. They're just like, no, we got a deck of animal cards here. So we're going to like go through the animal cards and, you know, probably some of the good animals were taken, like an octopus or a snake or whatever. But they did hit upon things like a puma. And, you know, let's make a villain called Puma. And um, a sable. Wait, what is what is actually a sable, Dan? I mean, do do, do, do you know or or uh... it's a fox. Okay, it is a it is a, it is a type of fox. Um, you know, but uh, you know, well implemented Kaiser Sose naming method on on these villains. You know, <laughs> name them up after what you see, and I don't know if they forgot about the existence of animals, but there you go, pulling out a sable. <laughs> Yeah, so this this is this is what they use for inspiration, and then you know they came up with some other ideas, and then you know we're also going to be talking about some of the other B books and the villains that were introduced in those, which were not the DeFalco friends from, but also by like Peter David and Jim Owsley uh, and the like. Um, but they all occurred, uh, they all appeared in Spider-Man comics during this run. They've all had some level of an impact. Um, you know, your mileage may vary. Um, and, and, you know, we're just going to go with it and just keep like banging this deck of cards gimmick, uh, into the ground. Like it's our, our, you know, like what we do. I mean, that's what our show's about. It's just, you know, killing jokes and beating dead horses. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to beat this, this horse dead. Like it's a uh, ace of spades, Dan. All right. So let's just, let's just do it. I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's what I'm about right now. That was a tortured metaphor, but, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, Jump tortured of like that. the jack of clubs yes. <laughs> there you go yes and um you know you're right the mileage may vary here so we're gonna rank all of these villains from a scale of two to ace you know just to, just to make it confusing one is above two on the scale you guys know how cards work um but before we get into any of that kevin and will i'm kind of curious to hear about your relationship with the uh tom defalco and ron friends run you know, whether this was your first time preparing for this episode that you'd read it in a long time or maybe your first time reading it ever. Kevin, do you want to answer that? Sure. Uh, I, my memory is these are the first comics that the first Spider-Man comics we got monthly. We had some old reprints and some uh, some of those uh, Ditko digests uh, and things like that. But we basically started like the very tail end of the Stern run. We'll started buying this as at a comic shop. And so most of what I remember reading was the DeFalco run, the uh, uh, the stuff, the Milgram, Peter David stuff in Spectacular. My poll list, my, my personal poll list started with Marvel Team Up 149, which quickly became Web. So like the first title I was getting and paying for myself was Web of Spider-Man and Marvel Team Up. So, And that's roughly in this era too. So this is like, for me, this is like nine, ten years old reading – monthly comics for the first time ever these are the books so yeah i remember yeah. them fondly i, I Me too, it's hard yeah. to the good ones and the bad ones i'm just like oh yeah i loved this as a kid often like i read them and i'm and uh, i'm surprised sometimes by the art or, or the story beats but i still love them even the flawed ones i just can't help it uh, yes just what kevin said we these were the first ones we sort of got on a regular basis Th this comic book store opened up near us or we discovered it or something like that and so it was our first time being able to get comics on a regular basis as opposed to just sort of seeing what happened to be at Walden Books or 7-Eleven when, you know, our mother took us there. So we – this was the ones we passionately were scrutinizing. So this this era is very near and dear to our hearts. That said, I had not reread it in some time. So in rereading it for this episode, it was it was kind of – it was the first time in a while I'd seen it. 
And like a lot of things that you love as kids, a lot of the flaws are more apparent to me. It's still, I still love it, like Kevin is saying. And the good parts stand out to me a lot more. But um, it's funny how like something can loom so large in your memory when you love it as a kid. And then you look at it as an adult, you're like, wait a minute did this story just end for no reason? And like, wait, this character's called slide or whatever. And, um, but yeah, this era of amazing and spectacular is, this is our sweet spot. Yeah. There's certain moment, like it's, it's less the characters and plot set stand out to me. It's like, there's certain just like three panel sequences that I'm like, Oh, I remember this perfectly for some reason. Uh, and it, it's baffling to me, but then it's like Puma shows up and I'm like, I remember some things about the Puma. Oh, I remember like, Spider-Man says like one line of dialogue. I'm like, oh, this panel for some, and it's weird what sticks in my memory. Because yeah, I haven't reread these since maybe junior high, maybe high school. Like once I left our house, I didn't have access to these issues. I didn't reread them ever again for sure. Yeah, but these are sentimental favorites for us. Well, very cool. So um, I imagine the villains probably occupy some of that territory as well. Um, So I'd love to hear you know as we go through them you know, your, your recollection of these characters and where they kind of exist in your knowledge of Spider-Man. So, um, no better place to get started. Again, we're, uh, we're ranking these from a scale of two to ace, whatever that means. And, uh, we're going to start off with, um, I'd say not, not the King. This is more like the Jack of characters. It's the Rose, um, first introduced in amazing Spider-Man 253, by Tom DeFalco and Rick Leonardi. Uh, Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Rose? Well, I mean, you know, obviously famously named after the animal that looks like a... <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Um, well, you know what? I'm actually... I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote the, the creator himself about the Rose. Does that work for you, Dan? Or do you not want me doing Go that? Go for okay, it. Uh, I can mean, you do your best Tom DeFalco impression while you do this? I mean, if, he, if I do my, my DeFalco imitation, it would just be like him being like, you guys are a bunch of idiots. Anyway, when I created the Rose, oh, I, I really won't do this. Uh, when I created the Rose, I wanted a character in middle management. We had all the big crime lords and then the second tier crime lords. And this guy was supposed to be second tier. He doesn't fight. He hires people to do the fighting. I put him in a mask and make him distinctive. It was not a plan that he would have a secret identity. But at some point later on, I was reading something about the big mystery of who is the Rose. I didn't realize there was a mystery. So I realized I'd have to come up with something for the Rose. And I figured I'd use Rod. Derek Kingsley, because we already eliminated eliminated him as the Hobgoblin, but he'd fit in perfectly as the Rose, which, you know, like all love for the Hobgoblin and the mystery aside, Dan, I got to say, like, Kingsley as the Rose just makes way too much sense for me, especially for how he's presented. He's this well-coiffed, well-put-together villain in a, like a pristine white suit and his little purple pullover uh, mask, if you will. Um, I mean, yeah, he's he's uh, he's like the next level of, of, of crime lord enemies. I mean, we had, you know, like I guess like he was then succeeded by Tombstone. But like, you know, I feel like we, we got that first wave of, of crime bosses with Kingpin and hammerhead uh and and uh cry master but like this is like the i mean is it considered still the bronze age at this point like the 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 bronze slash modern age uh criminal boss uh spider-man character and um and that's that's who the rose is what else is interesting to you about the rose dan well i mean it is important to say it ultimately he was not kingsley um he turned out to be richard fisk son of the kingpin um and owsley would subvert DeFalco's intentions, as we've discussed many times on our Hobgoblin episodes of, of this show, uh, in an issue of Web of Spider-Man, and uh, the rest was history. Um, the Rose remained uh, Richard Fisk, even after um, uh, Stern would come back and, and get another chance at all the whole Hobgoblin mystery. Um, you know, I, I just... This guy, to me, like as much as he's named the Rose, he always seems to be trimming roses out of his garden. Like this guy just massacres his his uh, his, his nice little like uh, uh, coterie of, of, of plants there. Uh, I, I, I um, as much as he like takes care of them, he's always trimming it. So uh, uh, they, they catch him always at the right time, too. So anyway, the Rose is an interesting character. Yeah. Uh, Kevin and Will, he's- what are your recollections or feelings about the Rose? He's never shown not trimming his rose bushes. It's he 
too much. It's too on the nose. I feel like uh, yeah. I, I like the look of the rose, but he's got to leave those bushes. I don't know. Just once in a while, do something else. Find another hobby. But I like his look. I like his look, and I do like the the way the secret identity worked out. I love him being Kingpin's son. I had forgotten that, so when I reread this, it took me by surprise, and I think that was really cool. I don't think they made they used that enough. I mean, that's such a rich story um, to have, like, and because he's a rebellious son who doesn't like his yeah. father, and yet he is being a crime lord working for him and sort of trying to overthrow him. That feels really s- strong to me. But uh, I, I guess maybe because DeFaco didn't have that in mind from the get-go, it's not really, like, used a lot until sort of the ending couple of fights. So I see it as a wasted opportunity. Um, I guess you guys have already talked the Hobgoblin mystery to death, but I don't like how the Hobgoblin identity ended up. And But I do like this one. I like I like Richard Fisk being the Rose. That makes him a lot more interesting to me. Right. Um, well, Richard so, Fisk, and I, and I think his look is great. Like, I think he's a really cool-looking villain, and uh, uh, he definitely was one that I remembered. A cool look does so much of the work for you. Just like, oh, he looks cool. <laughs> I already kind of mostly like this guy, uh, no matter what he does at this point, because it's simple and, and just memorable. I, I think fondly of the Rose. Um, I didn't realize he eventually dies or anything like that. I think that's during the period where maybe I wasn't paying as much attention. But I, I like I like the Rose a lot. He dies. He comes yeah, back. Vanessa Does it really matter? Or... <laughs> yeah. Nobody stays dead. I'm not too worried. <laughs> I do like that yeah, tradition would... in Spider-Man comics of the middle tier crime lords. Like starting with like in the Ditko era, like there was a, Kevin and I noticed. This is not difficult to notice. There's always a guy who's offering to organize all the gangs together. Like there's Stan Lee thought one of the great villains of our age was an organizer, I guess like that, because like there was always a person whose strength was I'll I'll centralize you guys. I'll be the one who gives all the orders. Right, Kevin? Wasn't there like four or five yeah. people that made that sales pitch? Yeah. Um, and they would just bring all the crime bosses together and just be like, put me in charge. I'm new. And they're, and they're always yeah. like, maybe, maybe yeah. we will. <laughs> maybe we will. And so the Rose is kind of in that tradition, but he does seem really good at his job, right? He seems pretty competent and stuff. He's really good at uh, having rose bushes. Uh, he's pretty good at organizing. <laughs> he's excellent at having rose bushes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I always loved the dynamic of how he handled the Hobgoblin, who is more of a kind of like loose, uh, you know, like, like like just kind of a nut. So, you know, who would fly in and out of his uh, home. And he seemed to have like uh, this kind of firm idea of how he could leash that character and, uh, and and use him for his own purposes, and and to me that always elevated the roses, um, uh, you know, like a uh, uh, place in the universe. Just because the hobgoblin seemed like an untamable force, and suddenly, you know, immediately in their run, they want to elevate their villain over the previous guy's villain. And I think you know the rose kind of fits that bill, um, as a lot of other creators would do to knock the previous guy's villain down and come up with something new and and far superior. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm with you guys. I I really enjoy the Rose. He's got a great look and a great uh, you know place in Spider-Man's Rogues Gallery, and I'm glad that he's back from the dead now. Even though he just recently got beat up in a one panel in <laughs> in a recent issue, but uh, he's a cool character. Yeah. And and uh, one of the rare classes, uh, uh, rather, a uh, characters that needs glasses. I like that. Yeah, I mean, you don't see a lot of representation from the nearsighted yeah. folks. <laughs> Yeah, Doc yeah. Ock and, and the Rose. I mean, I, yeah. I can't think of too many others. It's nice. I mean, original yeah. Peter Parker, but then he got rid of those. Yeah. yeah. And Mark, this is where you find yourself on the outs from well, all, I, all of us. I have again, corrected so. lenses here, guys. So, I mean, I I, good, I, good, you know, right. I, I just have the vanity uh, angle going here. So, you know, <laughs> I, I being called Marky Mark and the Four-Eyed Bunch too many times as a kid, this, this had its scars <laughs> on me. So I went I went for contact. So. <laughs> Um, oh, that's a good nickname. I'm going to use it. You like that? that? Yeah, we're going to start using it. All right, all right. right. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, something comes out on these episodes every year. I just I just want to add, though, Dan, <laughs> you know, to your point, and this is not to to be disagreeable with our guests because I, I love our guests. I love the Heinz brothers. But, uh, you know, Uh-oh. no, I mean, the whole, the, the, what you had just mentioned regarding the Hobgoblin and kind of like how he kind of like, you know, the, the interplay that goes on there, to me, that, that it makes more sense because, you know, under the Falcon and Friends, you know, originally the Hobgoblin was supposed to be – um, Richard Fisk, which is, you know, like the, the, the merry-go-round of who was what. Um, and I feel, again, like having Richard, you know, Fisk, you know, Kingpin's son as kind of this wild card 
character who has the goblin serum just kind of going off the rails and you know he wants he wants power in the criminal underworld but he's also going all over the place and you know like and having Ryder kingsley the fashion designer be this well quaffed masked villain who you know is very kind of proper and you know no no we're gonna we're gonna run the underworld like a legit you know like you know he's he's stringer bell here i guess trying to be legit with his uh with his uh criminaline in or whatever you want to call it right now i don't know it, to me like if those identities played out as defalco and friends had intended i think like it does make sense in that regard too although i do see the angle of having Fisk be the rose making some sense too. But like, I, 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 you know, there's like that fanfic part of me. That's like, if, if they got there, if, you know, they I think, I think you're way. right. Yeah. Like F Fisk is hobgoblin and Kingsley is the rose makes more sense. I like that story better. Cause then there's sort of, you know, the Kingpin's son is like opposite of him in temperament. Yeah. Uh, so that does. And that, but then yet he finds a father, he would in this hypothetical other world, find a father figure with Kingsley similar to his own father. Yeah. That, that does feel right. But I don't know, given how these pieces got jumbled right. up, the Hobgoblin's identity at this time, I don't love. And the Roses, I kind of I dig. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's where I end up with it. So, I, I do think, to, to belabor this point, like— uh, yes, let's belabor it. That dead horse needs beating. <laughs> yeah, let's beat that ace of spades. Is that what, oh, I forget what card that was. Um, the, the Hobgoblin feels less fun when he becomes the Rose's underling. Like, he seemed such his own man for a while, and during this whole arc, he just sort of becomes, like, a hired thug working for the Rose. Like, it works in this in isolation, but coming off of uh, Roger Stern's run, it's like, oh, the Hobgoblin already feels less, a little less cool mm. during this yeah, stretch. Yeah. Um, still a cool look, but... Yeah, I I think DeFalco and Friends like uh, made the mystery of the Hobgoblin more enticing, but like brought down the uh, allure of the characters like power set and and all of those things. But we've talked about the Hobgoblin to death. Let's rate uh, the the rose. the rose on our scale again, two to ace, um, which will remain elusive. The longer we do it. But, Why is uh, it we'll so difficult the, uh, for you? It's uh, the, the two is the low card, ace is the high card, Dan. What 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 is this? Have you <laughs> have you ever played poker, Dan? <laughs> you know, never. Okay. Uh, a pair yeah, a pair of aces but... beats a pair of twos, John. Uh, John, I just called you my son because I'm so frustrated with you, Dan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're revealing um, a lot here. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Will. Why don't you get us started? I'm going to do – okay, i got to be honest. I don't think any of the villains – no, that's not true. I don't think too many of the villains today we're doing are that strong. But I think the Rose is solidly okay. I'm going to give him a – I want to say nine, but he look, I'll give him a – I'll give him a ten. What suit? <laughs> um, hearts, I guess. They look the most like roses. All right. All right, Kevin, take it away. Uh, I, w I was also thinking 10 uh, without, without – I agree. I like a lot of these characters, but I don't think any of them are face card necessarily quality, uh, uh, I don't think. We'll see if I change my mind as we go through it. But like 10 was what I was thinking for the rose. I was thinking 10 of diamonds. Okay, sure. I'm, Kingpins that, has that a diamond makes, on that his That makes brooch. so much sense. Yeah, uh, Mark? Uh, okay, I'm – uh, I'm, you know, in my typical fashion, I'm, I'm going to raise the bar a little bit. I think he's he's a jack of diamonds. I think like the rose has been well deployed. I'm, yeah. I'm going to I, I and maybe it's I'm, I'm already kind of preempting, you know, who's to come on this list. And I feel like, you know, rose is very upper tier for this list um, that we're about to discuss. So for me, he's he's a face card. He's a jack of, of, of heart. I'm going to say jack of I'm going to say jack of spades. Mostly because I don't know what a spade is or where it fits in here, but uh, but Jack, <laughs> uh, Jack, Jack, uh, okay. Jack for I, me. I, I could see that. All right, all right. So we're moving on from one industrialist with a lot of money to another one, <laughs> and that is the Puma, uh, alter ego of Thomas Fireheart. Mark, tell us a little bit about the Puma. Well, he he is a a Native American bred to be the perfect warrior, prophesized to stop a future threat that might destroy the world. Um, one could argue whether or not this threat was ever manifested. Uh, he could also transform into a mountain lion werecat at will. Um, he is actually from the deck of cards. Uh, a puma, of course, being uh, derived from the animal puma. Um, <laughs> uh, Mr. Fireheart. I think I see the connection. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, it's, 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 it's a bit of a... Anyway, um, 
Thomas Fireheart, of course, uh, he, as you referred to, Dan, is a wealthy industrialist. In this case, he runs Fireheart Enterprises. Uh, but, you know, like all good mercenaries in, uh, excuse me, like all good industrialists in the uh, Marvel Universe, he does a little mercenary work on the side, you know, a little, little, little criming, a little light treason uh, when people aren't looking. Um, you know, sometimes he's like operated as Spider-Man's ally over the years. He even offered him a job. He like sent him on a honeymoon during this uh an annual issue of spectacular i mean we don't know if it actually counted um but you know it, it, it it's all part of it um, i bought that issue on my honeymoon oh I mean, very uh, sweet t- talk about kismet there and a very forgiving wife well I, what are you gonna do i <laughs> mean you know she i'm surprised she didn't turn into the puma when you uh spent your money on your honeymoon on comics like that um you know like I, I feel like in terms of like the 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 historical lineage of this character, I mean he was primarily featured during this run, um, but I, I I do have memories of him kind of extending into like the early mid '90s of comics. There's a very uh, st- standout cover. I think it was Mark Bagley and Jan Demetrius that run in like the late 300s of ASM, where the Puma is is on that. It was that Web of Life or one of those one of those storylines. Anyway. Um, what, what, what are, what are everyone else's thoughts about Puma? Dan, do you want to start? I really like the Puma. I actually think the guy has been underutilized in, in the Spidey office. I I think it's a cool character. Um, you know, may, maybe replaced in like the JMS run by like a character like Ezekiel. Um, but, uh, if only because of the industrialist element, but I think it's a cool angle, um, uh, for this character. Um, I think, this type of character is a little overutilized in the Ron Friends Tom DeFalco run. We'll get to talking about Silver Sable in a moment, but um, I think the whole like Native American warrior thing is a unique uh, take, and his particular motives I think are really interesting. And you know, anytime you put Spider Man either allied with or up against someone with money, it, there's an interesting contrast there. And like ultimately, there's a fun story where uh, the Puma or Thomas Fireheart buys the bugle and begins running pro Spidey editorial until he sells it back to Jameson for a dollar. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I've always been a big fan of the Puma and I'm surprised that no one brings him back for interesting stories that, you know, either fling Spider-Man to another part of the world or get him in, get in, in involved with like a native American uh, culture in some way. It just seems like an opportunity to put Peter into up against a whole kind of different world of of threats and and things and um yeah I, I've always had a soft spot for the puma how about how about you Kevin I agree with a lot of what you say I think he's underutilized I think he's a, another character that's got a really cool look um his first storyline I think is really fun even though it's a little craveny um he's just basically a a, a puma craven yeah um but I like it. I think that first storyline's good. And again, he looks so cool. But I will say, as a kid, w- when Puma would show up on the cover of an issue, I would be like, "Ah, nuts!" I didn't like him. He was—he didn't. The stories rarely interested me after this first uh, story. So when he would start coming back, I never—I was kind of bored by the Puma. Um, but I think that plays into just like I don't think he was used well. I don't think his stories were that interesting to me. So like. I don't. I'm not excited about the Puma, but I do think you could do really great Puma stories, and I just don't know if I've read them. They're also they might have existed. I you know there's a whole '90s era uh, uh, where I wasn't reading a lot, so maybe maybe there's some great Puma versus Ben Riley stories I missed out on. But uh, I uh, he's great potential so so character. I well, I, I I agree. I think Puma's a. I'll say it harsher than you, Kevin. Puma's a dud. I think he's a dud. I think the stories are boring. But I don't know why, because on paper there's a lot to like about him. I think they lean too much into the hunter aspect and not enough into the divided loyalties, like the yes. noble representative of the tribe versus making money. Uh, the sort of outcast were Native Americans in a in a country that uh, puts a lot of racism against them, but he is kind of a high status over you know do gooder. So they didn't really make a lot of that in these stories, and I felt the same way as a kid. If it was a Puma cover, I wasn't psyched. I and it doesn't feel fair, 
but I, for whatever reason, the result is Puma stories are duds. Some of that might have been that that hit Secret Wars two story with him was real bad, <laughs> so the Secret Wars two taint is kind of on Puma for a while. That's true. In my That's head. true. That might, that might be what did it. But uh, I think too much powers, not enough emotional backstory, make the Puma. Who cares? I, I I will just say to kind of pile on here. You know, you're you're, you're kind of questioning. Like, yes, I I agree. Good look. Um, like there's a there's some intrigue to the backstory there. But why doesn't he work? I just don't think he's a good Spider-Man villain. I just don't. I th- I think that you know, like I think you know what what goes into a good Spider-Man villain. Yeah. You know, maybe he's an X-Men guy. Or, or I was even gonna say like an Iron Man um, villain. You know, kind of like you know, like a wealthy. Yeah. You, know, you kind of go with like the business to business. You know, like like you always. You know, I. I Yes, like you know, there's the the animal element to Spider-Man that has always kind of like like perforated the villains uh, in his rogues gallery. I mean, but... re- regionally, regionally, he should be Hulk, right? He's southwestern uh, America in the desert. That would set him up against the Hulk a lot. Yeah, I... and he turns into a beast, but he's in control. There might be there might be some interesting parallels there. And like, I know that there's like you know, I guess some like ethical dilemma with Peter and Spider-Man in terms of like, well, he's got this money and you know, like, you know, like Dan, the storyline you referred to him, like buying the bugle and being pro Spider-Man is this, you know, is this, is this responsible, you know, but like, it's, it's, it's kind of flimsy to me. Like it's like, I I like the villain, but I just don't like him in a Spider-Man comic. And I think that's part of the reason why he just has not been used. Cause it's like, you know, really, how do you, how do you use him over the long term in a way that make that, that doesn't turn him into Craven? Like which is others have noted noted is like you know the other direction you can go there, but it's you know that that seed has been taken. So um, yeah, it, it's it's just well, kind of lackluster for me. I wouldn't call him a dud. No offense, Will, but I would I would say he's a dud. I would say lackluster. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think he could work as a Spider-Man villain. I think him being a um, a successful businessman. Um, and sort of an outsider who's like turned it into a success could be a neat thing to put up against Peter Parker and Spider Man. I I don't I like him more as a villain than as an ally, I'll be honest. I think as an ally I don't have much use for him. He doesn't do much for me. But as a villain he's interesting. I do get bored of um I do it for the money as my only motivation. It's like, oh, why am I hunting Spider Man? Because someone paid me to. It's like, oh, I don't care then. Uh <laughs> I don't like characters that whose main motivation is getting paid. I don't, I don't think that adds a lot. I like I I do like Craven more because like Craven like wants to hunt the spider for the challenge of it. He wants to get paid too, maybe, but he has to pay for all his pelts or whatever. Uh, but he does it for the challenge. I like that way more interesting than though the Puma sort of gets into the challenge of it a little bit. But again, the business side of him is more interesting. But yeah, he's not great. <laughs> Craven's later might say he's a don't install themselves. <laughs> yeah. all right. So so Doug, what does that mean on the card scale, Will, for you? There are actually worse duds, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put the Puma at. Gosh, I know he's got the potential to be a Jack, but in these stories, he's a seven, my friends. Puma's a seven. Kevin, uh, once again, I'm going just barely over Will. I had him as an eight, probably an eight of clubs. Going to suit everything, even though it doesn't mean anything. Seven of diamonds for the Diamondbacks. He probably roots for the Diamondbacks. Oh, that's a good, good, good call. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to split the difference here. I'm going to do eight of diamonds because I'm, I'm going to take a little from both of the Heinz brothers here. So. Okay. And I'm going to go with nine. I just have a soft spot for the Puma. And uh, nine of hearts because he goes straight to my heart. Um, all right. <laughs> let's, his, let's... his look alone should elevate him. Like Ron Friends designed a cool-looking guy. Yes. Yeah. For sure. Ab- absolutely. So um, leaning into uh, design elements, it's in her name. Silver Sable introduced in Amazing Spider-Man 265 by Tom DeFalco and Ron Friends. Mark, tell us all about Silver Sable. I mean, longtime uh, followers of both this show and of Chasing Amazing probably know how much I love Silver Sable, sarcasm indicated. She is the founder and owner of Silver Sable International from Simcaria. She runs a group of mercenaries called the Wild Pack. 
And I always love when they bring the WoW pack back and they give them their own series. And that comic usually lasts like two issues because who's going to read about the WoW pack? Anyway, notable for her entirely silver outfit and hair, which um, turns silver after her mother's death, of course. Uh, she is, in fact, from that infamous deck of cards, which the sable again is a – what is that, Dan? It is a – It's a fox. It's a fox. She's a foxy sable. I don't know. Anyway, she's got no superpowers. She's just really good at fighting. And, like, you know, she's just, you know, like, such a good mercenary. She's kind of like Nick Fury, but silver. Um, she starts sort of as a foe of Spider-Man's, um, but then, you know, kind of becomes like the enemy of my enemy is my silver sable. Um, I mean, she even later on has feelings for Spider-Man, uh, according to Dan Slott. Didn't see that one coming. Um, and then rescued. And you would never hear about it again either. Yes. And then even further, um, rescued by the foreigner who is her ex-husband and used, uh, an LMD to get revenge on those who wronged her and her country as she recovered in the, in the hospital. Um, what a backstory, Dan. Uh, what else is there to say about Silver Sable? Well, I think, you know, one of the interesting things about her is that She's kind of uh, appeared in like video games over the years. She's kind of got an elevated like media persona. Like even in the animated shows, Silver Sable was a pretty frequent staple. Um, and I don't really get why, because I like you, Mark, am not the biggest fan of the character. I just don't really get her other than the fact that it's a like sexy female villain for Spider-Man. Um, or or on again, off again, ally. But like, I feel like that spot is already taken by Black Cat in the most interesting ways. So I don't really understand the presence of Silver Sable in the kind of Spidey media landscape. She's fine, and I won't begrudge Ron Friends and and Tom DeFalco one of their creations going on to bigger things. But I've never really gotten the appeal of silver sable maybe outside of her very silvery design uh heinz brothers anything to say about silver sable kev let me go first you can get the last word great i'll take a quick nap <laughs> take a nap um okay i think this is the opposite of puma for me on paper this character shouldn't work at all it's a redundant half seems like a redundant sort of half idea mishmash of like pretty lady villain anti-villain but in practice i love it i love silver sable I think my I think my opinion is bolstered by her appearance in the 2018 video game. She was really fun in that video game, I think. And so that might retroactively make me just kind of like her appearances in these stories, which I admit are uneven. Um, but I, th I don't know. Something about the look. It's funny you were saying about Black Cat. Black Cat is definitely a superior character to Silver Sable. But Black Cat is such a ripoff of Catwoman to me. That at mm. least Sable is distanced from Catwoman uh, and yet has the potential to sort of capture a lot of that sort of same role. The Simcaria stuff works for me. The whole like hero back home, villain over here kind of reminds me of a Magneto situation. Like she protects her own and has no mercy for anybody else. I, you know, the the test of am I excited to read a story if she's on the cover? She passes it. I'm like I'm curious to see what happens. So, not a dud, uh, not as not as well thought out as some of the other villains, but I'm I'm pro Sable. I I so this is the character I was most nervous about talking about because I feel like Silver Sable's very very popular. Uh, I don't know if that's true. She feels like she's very popular, and I was like, oh, Dan and Mark are gonna love Silver Sable, and I'm gonna come in as the low man. I don't like Silver Sable. Again, she's another character that's a mercenary. I, I'm not interested in mercenaries. Uh, I don't care about some, you know, characters that pull Spider-Man out of New York, but she doesn't really do it for me as a character that's, like, bringing him on international spy missions. It doesn't work for me. Uh, nothing about her is exciting, except for, as Will said, she's great in a video game. Yeah. It's a great role for her as sort of these the police force that's brought into the city that uh, yeah. I think she's really, really fun in that game. I really like that character in that game. Um, so like it doesn't elevate her in the comics for me. I've never read a comic with silver Sable where I was excited to see her I'm bored by her generally. Um, like, I, I, like 
Yeah, I'm tr- Dan Slott had a couple stories where she was okay, and to me, I was like, "What an achievement!" Uh, <laughs> that I'd, I'm not bored by this character in this moment. The, the, the storyline works. Uh, I don't remember that that she had feelings for him. I, every character seems that. I also forgot Gene DeWolf had feelings for Spider Man, which doesn't work yeah. for me <laughs> tremendously. Well, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, my point is, Silver Sable is a dud. No, <laughs> not quite a dud, but I, I don't like her. I think she's boring. She's bland. I would just say like. What are the memorable Silver Sable stories? And I I, I agree with what you're saying. Kevin. None. No. Your point, I, right? But I'm saying like <laughs> I mean like to your point, Kevin. Like there's clearly a popularity there because she's in video games. She's had her own spinoff series and miniseries. I mean, I made the joke about like you know there was one where I think it was a couple of years ago, Marvel released one issue to see if it would sell enough to justify a second issue, and it did not. Um, but, I mean, there was a series in the 90s, I think ran for like 30 or 40 issues or so. I mean, like, you know, so like there is, you know, there is a fan base there, clearly, but like I, I cannot for the life of me, uh, the only story that I think of when I think of Silver Sable is when she gets beaten to death presumably by was it rhino and ends of the earth or yeah so like yeah and and it's not that i particularly like ends of the earth but i'm like oh yeah that's when she got beaten to death except she didn't actually die but like you know what i mean like it, it, i can't think of and certainly not from this era i cannot think of stories that are all that memorable it's just like she's this there um and yeah there's i guess you know sex appeal if you see it like fictional you know, illustrated characters in that regard. Um, but, you know, again, if you if that's how you see it, I think you got more in Black Hat. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, like, what do you, what do you got here that, that that is your big takeaway with this character? I really like silver as a color scheme. That's my <laughs> that's that's my thing. Um, so that might be get, it. That, let's get to uh, rating these. Uh, OK, for all, for all my positive decided... talk, I'm still going no higher than a nine. I'm going to go in nine for Sable. Um Hearts, because I love her. Kevin? Wait, no. Clubs, because she's got a club. Wild, The wild kids are a club. Not a club. <laughs> wild pack. <laughs> Great. Wild um, kids. I think she'd be a good Iron Fist villain. Mm. Uh, anyway, uh, or Heroes for Hire character. Uh, uh, I put her as a five. Uh, uh, I do think she could be worse. Like, there's... And mo- maybe that's all the video game. Maybe she'd be a two or three otherwise. But I can, I now can see some potential with her. I make her a five of clubs as well. Because of the wild pack, I'm gonna do six of diamonds. Because I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a fan. I'm really not. And if it wasn't for the the pop culture proliferation, I would have probably gone two or three. But yeah, six. Five of diamonds for me. I, I guess diamonds are silver. How am I the Ish. second highest on this? That's crazy. I, I mean, you know, like, no. like, like thank goodness for you, Will. You, you kind of saved me there. So thank you. <laughs> I saved your credibility, yeah. But and I look like Marky an idiot. Mark and his silver sable. Uh, I, I mean, club, like I'm, I, I've literally been ripping on this character since I started chasing Amazing years ago. Like I'm always just like Silver Sable, who I hate. Um, anyway, so there you go. <laughs> Um, so this next one will be interesting because this character is not a Spider-Man villain, um, but has a very memorable storyline from this run that is kind of controversial. So that character is Fire Lord, who was introduced in Thor number 225 by Jerry Conway and John Buscema. Um, here he shows up in Amazing Spider-Man 269 and 270. Uh, we could go back and forth on uh, on this. I think the real discussion to be had here is Fire Lord, Herald of Galactus. Should Spider Man be able to go toe to toe with this guy? Um, do we think that's appropriate in the pages of these comics? Let's let's be real here, Dad. The only reason why there's a true controversy here is because Dan Slott had to open his big fat mouth on Twitter uh, a few years ago and be like, "No way could Spider Man beat Fire Lord." I mean, you know, most <laughs> most hardcore fans are just like, "Yeah, he kicked Spider Lord's butt. It's so great." I mean, I, you know, like what what are we like- complaining about here? <laughs> I like Mark, the uh, master of a thousand comic book writer voices. <laughs> <laughs> Geriatric Dan Slott is what we just got. Uh, but, um, Ger- fair Dan, Dan um, Slott meets I, Jimmy Stewart. Anyway, continue. <laughs> but but yeah, like, you, you, you could you could argue this. Like, I don't love that Spider Man beats up the X Men in Secret Wars. You know, like, is that more preposterous than than beating up Firelord? I I, I don't know. Um, so Some yeah, X-Men, we'll jump sense. in here. 
I mean, Spider Man's an incredibly powerful character. Like it, there some X Men. I could see him taking out Cyclops pretty easily and uh, Angel pretty easily. Beast, yeah. I mean, really, Phoenix, no. Rogue, no. But like Colossus, no. All right, it gets rough. But um, <laughs> Fire Lord, no way. I mean, the the only way he should beat Fire Lord is some sort of game of wits or like a Dark Knight Returns style using all possible resources just to stun Fire Lord momentarily like Batman does to Superman in Dark Knight Returns. Like, that should be it, or you're sort of straining the credibility. That said, Fire Lord's a dud. <laughs> Fire Lord's a dud. I think too many heralds of Galactus is running around talking about their power cosmic. Galactus got to take their power back and make them get a minimum wage job. Enough of these guys running around destroying planets and stuff like that. I, uh... Not to relitigate the Secret Wars X Men fight, I think Spider Man could win. He didn't win the fight. Will and I talked about this a little bit on our podcast. He sort of knocked them back and ran. Mm. I buy that from Spider Man. If yeah, he had if the element of surprise, prolonged, if it was a prolonged battle, he should lose. But he could knock Wolverine over, surprise Storm and and, and Cyclops or whoever was there, and get out of there. No problem. I mean, Professor X then like erases his memory. I mean, that's questionable use of his powers particularly at that time, but, you know, the, the X-Men win in the end there. Anyway, I don't think... I think Spider-Man could beat Fire Lord. Any character can beat any character if written well. I think the complaint... I think this was Dan Slott's complaint, but maybe not. It was just that he wins by just punching him a lot. And that is sort of a boring <laughs> resolution. Like, compared to the Juggernaut resolution where he punches him a lot and that does nothing, he has, hits him with a gasoline truck and it does nothing, he has to, like, sink him into concrete to slow him down for a while... Uh, for a few months, uh, like there's nothing like that here. That so it's missing that sort of fun resolution to it. Uh, as a character, I think Fire Lord's okay. He's a bottom tier good Herald of Galactus. He's not like the Airwalker. I think there's one that's the Airwalker. There's, like, uh, there's a couple real lame ones. He's certainly not the Silver Surfer, uh, and he's certainly not as fun as Terax. So he's like below those two as heralds go. But he's got an okay look. Um, I think it's fun to see him go up against Spider-Man briefly, but when it when it comes down to it, like the re- the end of that story, I'm just sort of like, and you win. Yeah, yeah. I feel like if you're a, you're a Herald of Galactus, you already have like kind of a semi decent baseline. But 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 to your to your point, Kevin, I, I'm glad you brought up the Juggernaut story because I feel like that's that's always what I think of with the Fire Lord story because it's like it's almost like a a, a page for page regurgitation of juggernaut and then but then like we get to the end and spider-man is just like f this i'm just gonna cut the gordian knot and punch him until he like you know is unconscious and the avengers stop me and it's kind of like oh uh, okay i mean you know that's that's a cool visual if you love spider-man but like you know it also sets up you know countless uh debates on twitter when like spider-man gets into a fight with the vulture and loses like no this is the same guy who yeah. we got fire lord what are you talking about and it's just like all I right just, yeah, yeah i, I don't like, think you know thousand yes, voices I, there we go again I, I, <laughs> <laughs> that's voice eight i think okay, yeah, keep, 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 keep track going, keep it going. yeah i just don't think it'd be dishonorable for spider-man's victory quote unquote over fire lord to be holding him off until the Avengers show up. I, I, as a fan, that wouldn't bother me. That's, like, smart, and I don't know. That's that's what I kind of wish it was. Or, yeah, or I mean, some like, kind of more creative solution like Juggernaut, like some kind of— I mean, of... Spider-Man's fought the Hulk. He's fought very powerful people, and, like, those are fun stories when they're done well. I mean, also this story suffers because, like, he's fighting Fire Lord because Fire Lord got pizza and people attacked him, and, like, and Spider-Man attacked him, and he— ch- like. The Juggernaut had, like, the heart of the story. It's like he had to stop the Juggernaut from killing somebody and then get back at him, like, serve justice because he had killed somebody, right? This was just sort of like, I don't know, talk to him. Get him to leave the city. It's like, hey, man, I I know you're just wanting a pizza. New York's not that kind of place. We don't have a lot of aliens dropping by. Oh, cool. I'm out of here then. I'll head over to That said, the the pizza sequence made me smile. Like, when he was in the pizza place. Pizza's so good. It'd be a very funny issue of silver surfer it, it, i don't hate this story i just think it is not great that's all it's, I'm, it's just flat it, compared to the other similar stories i'm an unabashed fan of this story for one reason which is you know in the juggernaut story juggernaut is really indifferent to spider-man's presence 
Um, here, Fire Lord takes it on the offensive at a certain point, and to the point that Peter quits mid mid story and has to uh, convince himself w- like why he you know like why he needs to get back in the battle with Fire Lord. And I really like that emotional beat in the story. That, that is good. like he's like I could disappear. He doesn't know what I look like, and let me get out of this. But he chooses to engage. And that feels like a real like yeah. Spider Man decision, um, and That's I true. think it's a really great moment in, in this comic. You're right; I don't love the ending, but I do love all of the like you know myriad of ways he softens up Fire Lord by blowing him up in the conveniently demolishing building, and 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 there's two different buildings needing demolishing in this story. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's that great panel of Fire Lord like zipping through multiple uh, buildings. Um, yeah. It just elevates the scale of this to a, a huge extreme. Um, yeah, I don't really, I mean, canonically, uh, Fire Lord is supposed to be able to move at the speed of light. I don't know how Spider-Man stops that character, but I think, you know, for a, a short little aside like this, I'm totally okay with it. Um, and I, I'm an unabashed fan of this story, despite the ending. Yeah, the points you bring up are good points. Like Spider-Man kind of go back into civilian is cool. The fact that Fire yeah. Lord is chasing him is cool. I, I, yeah. I feel like more could be done with that than was done in this story, but uh, those are good points. All right, so Ace let's of, get Ace to of, our Ace of Hearts. Let's get to our <laughs> ratings here. <laughs> yeah, so I'm so swayed. A, Fire Lord's a five for me. He's a five. Kevin? Five of fire. I put him as a four. It's weird to put him below Silver Sable, but I am uh, a f- four of hearts. It's the His video game because right I have the same thing. Like I'd rather see it. The video game has like elevated Sable in my mind. Not that she was so incredible there, but she was fun and good there. No, she's really fun in that game. I think it's a great sequence in that game. Like when the scene when she drops out of the jet and like lands, and yes. there's some really great moments where I'm like excited. And that when I've replayed the game, I'm like, oh, here's this Silver Sable sequence. Yeah. The story's a 10, but the villain's a 5 for me. And I'm similar to Mark. I think I think uh, he's like a 3 or 4. I never need to see another Spider-Man versus Fire Lord storyline. Yeah. I just, you know, like, we got that something can stop the Juggernaut. Fine. You can, I, I'm cool with revisiting Spider-Man versus the Juggernaut. I, I don't need it with Fire Lord. So, um, cool story, not great Spidey villain. Has he come back? Has he ever come back in a Spider-Man story? Not to my knowledge, no. Well, then I assume that no. So speaking of someone who appeared once and then randomly came back, it's Manslaughter Marsdale, <laughs> introduced in Amazing Spider-Man 271, uh, Whatever Happened to Crusher Hogan, from Tom DeFalco and Ron Friends. Mark, you and I have discussed being huge fans of this comic, but are we fans of the villain of this comic, Manslaughter Marsdale? Um, an interesting character, and um, one of the interesting things that I learned in our history of the show, uh, all the way back in Superior Spider Talk 14, when I interviewed Ron Friends, was that uh, he was originally drawn as a white man, uh, but the colorist assumed he was black because of how Ron drew his hair. And so you've got this, you know... Uh, I, I think fairly unique uh, villain in Manslaughter Marsdale, at least, uh, you know, not very many Spider-Man villains of of a different race. And uh, so uh, I, I, I think Manslaughter Marsdale stands out uh, no matter what you think of the character. So, Mark, anything you want to add about Manslaughter Marsdale, this very strong Boxer. Uh, I, 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 I do want to add on a personal note that for the longest time, whenever I saw the cover of Amazing Spider-Man number 271, I mean, it, it has the title, Whatever Happened to Crusher Hogan, but there is this hulking uh, black man uh, standing over Spider-Man. And, and I was like, wait, is that Crusher Hogan? Oh, wait, no, no, no. It's Manslaughter Marsdale, which, I mean, might speak to really what my takeaway from that comic is about the villain itself. But uh, just to give a little more of a biography here, I will I will um, add that um, Marsdale worked for Madame Fang, who was set up to be another gang lord, or a gang lord in New York City, but actually never really appeared again. Uh, he had an operation that removes his ability to feel pain. Um, get me some of that next time I run a marathon. Uh, and kind of the, uh, the, the impetus of this issue is he wants to keep this 
young boxer Bobby Chase to remain with his gym, and he's willing to do anything to keep him there. So, uh, Heinz Brothers, do you have anything to add about manslaughter, Marsdale? Stories of ten, villains of three. I uh, wish he was better, but what a story! Like my one of the, the best issues of this run for me really moves me. When Crusher Hogan gets back to his apartment and it's filled with Spider-Man posters, I was legit taken aback. I'd forgotten about that moment. Such a cool looking at something from the other side. Just a, a terrific, terrific issue. The villain doesn't need to be good. Crusher Hogan's emotional arc is the star of this issue. But if you're asking me to rate that villain, that guy's a three. Whoops, we weren't supposed to do numbers yet. I just, I'm not into him. Jump of the gun. Yeah, uh, I'm going to say everything that you guys have just said. Uh, great story. The Crusher Hogan stuff's great. It's a really fun ending. Uh, the villain's boring. He's, I mean, Spider-Man's got a bunch of these like villains that are just like a strong dude, and I don't like almost any of them. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, this is a, uh, the meteor man or a guy named Joe, just a guy who punches hard. It's just boring. I have no interest. If I never need to see this character ever again, um, I'd rather see him fight fire Lord again. There's something there, <laughs> but, uh, the story's great. The story's great. Well, it's funny because he would show up again and I had totally forgotten about this, but he shows up in amazing Spider-Man 309 from the Michelini run. Um, in like the opening and he's like, I got to go tell Madam Fang about Spider-Man. <laughs> and again, we would never see Madam Fang. So uh, there was some setup there for something that we never got. And then he would show up again in various other titles, most notably Dark Rain. He had like a prominent role in a few issues there. I don't know why. Maybe somebody was fond on this particular issue of Amazing Spider-Man and thought, man, Slaughter Marsdale. That's a guy who needs to be brought back. Um, I, this I don't feels agree, like one of those but... characters that's trotted out in a Punisher story when you need Punisher to kill somebody. Mm. Uh, which, uh, Or any character where it's like, oh, we need a bunch. Like uh, It was like some story on where the hood had a bunch of D-list villains working for him. I can imagine Manslaughter being one of those. It's just like, oh, there's no, there's no hook. There's nothing interesting about him. What's his character? I don't know. I always love the lengths that these normal uh, characters have to be like justified uh, to to fight Spider-Man. It's like, OK, we have this strong guy, but we know how strong Spider-Man is. So we'll say that he had an operation to remove his ability to feel pain, you know, and it's like, uh, OK, that's pretty random that this guy is is that guy. I guess you could say he's an elite boxer. So maybe that benefited him in some way. Uh, but uh, uh, I just love like seeing the lengths writers go to to justify why they're having Spider-Man just fight a dude. Yeah. I feel like if I didn't feel pain, I would get, I would lose faster. Yeah. Cause I, I wouldn't like hold back. I'd be like, oh, I can take this. And I'd be out cold. Be like, yeah. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> he punched you. I didn't feel anything. <laughs> Mark, what are your thoughts on manslaughter Marsdale? I mean, just echoing what others have said. I mean, the, the, this individual comic is one of my favorite stories from this run. And one of my favorite stories from amazing spider-man period but um it's not because of van slaughter marsdale um you know so um <laughs> I, I i'm just as happy to jump to the grades here there's not much to say about the character beyond like eh, another dime a dozen <laughs> you know like you said strong guy who can punch people thing so yeah. mark's famously a silver sable I fan mean, you know so there's enough room for it, Get, put a little more silver brushing on that that that, <laughs> that 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 like you know leather black jacket and I'm there for sure. So he does have those silver knuckles, so mm. maybe maybe that gets him a little more into your in, into your camp. Put there. him in the wild pack. Ooh. Add him to the wild pack. Now we got Ooh, something. Yeah. Let him learn a little something. Simcaria could use a little diversity, anyways. Uh, <laughs> make it's it true. New, new, make him a herald of Galactus. New, new final. <laughs> new final boss with no power upgrade i see i a... would read a manslaughter marsdale ace comic <laughs> oh ace oh man say, there's a shout out are you saying, anyway are you well you a... gave him a three uh three. do you want to say what uh suit um I'll say I'll say clubs because he's in a boxing club. Mm. I appreciate how much you thought about that. You mm. really took a pause there <laughs> to, make, to make that the right choice. Uh, Kevin, how about you? Two, two of clubs. There's nothing interesting about this guy for me. Yeah, it's probably that's probably what I should have done. I'm gonna say two of hearts because he he could have been a contender. 
but <laughs> and I'm going to say two enjoy, of clubs as well. Uh, but it is that suits. time at the middle of our show where we take a little break. Mark, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about our spider slack? My God, we're only at the middle then. What is this like? <laughs> More in peace here. Hundreds of listeners like you hang out in our community of Spider-Man fans on Slack. The amazing Spider Slack community is absolutely free to join, and you can jump into active conversations with awesome people about collecting, conventions, movies, new comics, old comics, and more. Dan, I haven't been there as much this week, so tell me, what's going on? Actually, Mark, I want to throw this one out to Will and Kevin, who are members of our Slack. Kevin's been a member for a long yeah. time, and Will is fairly new. Kevin, what keeps you engaged with our Slack? Uh, you know, I've been. I think I've been a member for about a year and a half, I would guess, probably something along those range. It's gotten a lot busier uh, in that time. Like when I first started, there'd be days where like not much would be posted. It feels like it, it rarely goes an hour where someone doesn't post something now. Uh, some days it gets really busy. I, I think it's really fun. Uh, recently, people were rating their favorite writers of Mary Jane, like who writes the character of Mary Jane the best. I thought that was interesting. I have no opinion or take All on that. All zeros. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, nobody's ever written her well. Uh, so I think that's just interesting. Uh, you get people who've read and come up at different times. Like Will and I started in the DeFalco era in the very end of the Stern era. And a lot of people who are reading it came up during JMS or during the Clone Saga. And they just have such different takes. It's very interesting to hear what people's favorite character, writers, characters, moments, what they think are strong. We, there's a lot of agreement, but there's not all agreement. Uh, there's no fighting, though. That's the nice part. It's like we tend to debate and then move on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i not there as much as Kevin, but uh, I have really enjoyed – I've learned a lot. And I have a couple times asked questions, hey, you know, I've never read the Ultimate Run. Who can, you know, help me out? How much do I need to read before, I, before I'm going to see the, see the magic or whatever? And like – or, you know, what am I missing about what's wrong with whatever era – and what are the good uh, silver it, sable how, stories? No, sorry. <laughs> what are the? I mean, I know there's at least ten. <laughs> What's everybody's top ten silver sable stories? I said. <laughs> um, and everyone, everyone's pretty nice. Like a lot of times, asking a question in a Reddit or in a, any kind of discussion forum is just like inviting abuse, where you get the equivalent of read the friggin' manual type of answers. But uh, I've had to, a lot of nice help. There's a lot of thoughtful, very informed people. And like Kevin says, I think my favorite part is I haven't seen people get, like, personally offended that somebody just has, like, a different opinion, you know, or doesn't, like, connect to a certain artist or character. They're, they're pretty they, – they like to debate. They don't like to dominate, I guess, is, is, is what I like. Um, so I really, I really enjoyed it. It's a nice community. Well, I'm thrilled that you guys are a part of that community uh, and and contributing, um, you know, more than my co-host does. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, for those listening at home, Mark just gave me the biggest stink eye. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of fun. And and, and speaking of Mark, uh, we you know we have a conventions uh, uh, chat in the Slack uh, where people can talk about the conventions. And Mark, you wanted to talk about a convention that's upcoming yeah i i do this is this is plugging a little bit of uh local and when i say local i mean like hyper local they literally do this convention down the street from where i live uh it's called huracan it's in east rockaway new york on long island uh and they're doing they're actually doing two of them this year they usually do it in november but this time they're doing the first one on june 17th and it's at uh bethany church uh in east rockaway and uh this uh, east rockaway was very hard hit uh, during Superstorm Sandy in 2011, and uh, Huracans, their their proceeds actually go to helping to rebuild and, and you know ho people who lost their homes or lost a lot of their possessions uh, during Superstorm Sandy. I know it was over 10 years ago now, but people are still kind of recovering and and digging out from that. It was a really bad hurricane storm, you know, here in New York. Um, you know, in 2012. So, you know, if you're in, you know, Nassau County, Long Island and want to check out some some comics, I, I know Keith Williams, who was on our uh, our, our show from Terrificon uh, last summer. He sometimes appears at Huracan. I'm not sure if he's coming back for this one, but he, he will be there from because he's a local person as well. Uh, you know, come check out Huracan. So thank you for letting me plug that down. 
Are you going to be there, Mark? Oh, I will be there uh, shopping, and there will be a raffle, and I'm actually going to give one of my books a signed copy of 100 Things Spider-Man Fans Should Know and Do Before They Die as part of the raffle. Uh, so I know Ooh, nice. I know people, you know, they're hard to find for less than a dollar on Amazon <laughs> uh, Marketplace, but you can you can win one with a raffle, and it'll go to a good cause. So there you go. Or if you already who's own si- one. Who's signing it? Yeah, bring it there, and Mark will sign your copy, yeah. Or that, too, exactly. But but also bid on the raffle one, too. I mean, you know. I want one signed by Dan, but not Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Just to really confuse the, the... – my, 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 What's going My favorite on? was a Z, our listener Zeke, who had Dan Slot sign my book, uh, and then and, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, that's that's one way to do it. So there our, we go. <laughs> our listeners want us, not many of our listeners, but a couple of our listeners are asking that we autograph comic books that we have read and then send it to them. <laughs> Which I'm like, what a useless autograph! But the, it's so dumb that I sort of want yeah. to do it. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Well, anyway, Red uh, th- th- this is to say, uh, come join our Slack so you can interact with all of us. And uh, yeah, it'll be a good time. So let's get back to our discussion of some of these villains. Next up, I- I'll admit, a personal favorite, Slide, introduced in Amazing Spider-Man 272 by Tom DeFalco, Ron Friends, and Sal Buscema. Uh, who also did our uh, our amazing logo for this podcast? But um, uh, I I love Slide. I can't really put my finger on it, mostly because he's so slippery. You slide But it off. Uh, Mark, <laughs> why, why don't you tell us a little bit about Slide? I mean, obviously based on the animal known as the Teflon fry pan, uh, he is <laughs> the alter ego of Jalome. Is that how you say it? Jalome or Jalami? What is it, Dan? I, you know I'm great with Dan. Sure. Sure. Jalome Beecher. <laughs> Beecher. That's his name. Chemical engineer who worked for Beemont. Not remotely like DuPont. Anyway, uh, it's a manufacturer who created a chemical that removes friction from any object. Uh, he gets fired and decides, you know what? Screw you. I'm going to become a slippery villain with my chemical substance. Um, you know, that old chestnut. Uh, he is another silver character. Uh, he wears a silver uniform with goggles and green pads. Um, very Dicko esque, I would say, uh, for sure. Uh, so, yeah, and we know we're on friends love his Dicko characters. So, um, so th- th- this guy he skates around at high speeds. Uh, you know, try and catch him, and he just like squeezes right out, like a you know right right out. I mean, that was a sound effect. I don't know if that comes across on this podcast, but I did it. Um, and you're like a you're like an old school vaudevillian I, with all the voices <laughs> and the sound effects. Yeah, uh, people should know like we a, do not have a soundboard. This is all Mark. Like yeah, they might think it's a soundboard otherwise. Um, yeah. The slide enters a room. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, sadly, uh, Dan, for your sake, uh, maybe a few other fans, he is killed during a civil war when he is shot in the back of the head by. Uh, uh, an associate of the Hammerhead. Uh, what do we think of Slide, folks? I'll go first because I'm dumbest. I <laughs> I like him, and I can't tell you why. He looks insane and stupid. The powers are dumb, but like you're saying, it is very Ditko-y. Like I, I could easily see Steve Ditko coming up with something like this. He also weirdly reminds me of Frozone. Like some of his like skating shots look from The Incredibles, um, uh, when he's like crouched down and like and skittering into a room. It's like it looks like a Frozone entrance. I could see that. But yeah. um, uh, the look and weirdly the dumbness of him, I'm endeared to Slide. I don't think. I would want <laughs> many slide stories, but <laughs> S- slide kind of showing up halfway through a story with another marquee villain uh, as like, you know, sort of like almost like the middle section of a comic, I think would be great. Um, he, he is a, he is a throwback in a way. So I don't know. I, 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 you know, when it, when he was introduced as like, this is the stupidest idea for a villain. This is the fool killer of this run. And then by the end of this show, I was like, I'm into him. I like Slide. I like Slide a lot. I, I more than 
he's more fun than just like a speed demon, for example, like who's just fast. Like there's a little more to him than that. I think that works really well. Uh, I agree. I don't know how much you could get out of the character, but I like the. I mean, I also like the Ringer, so I got some problems. These characters that do feel like Steve Ditko, visually interesting characters, just do a lot for me. And Slide is fun. Um, he's also like when you've got a character who's sticky, it does sort of make sense to have a character who is unstickable. <laughs> yeah, uh, there is some logic there. Uh, I don't he's think al- he is. He's also a fun double crosser. Mm. Yeah. Right. Slide double crosses all the time. That's kind of yeah. fun. He's certainly not like an A list villain, uh, or even maybe even a B list villain, but he's a fun villain, and I I'm in favor of Slide. I'd like to see more Slide. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. Like I I I don't, or maybe <laughs> slippery is the the way. You know, it's a slippery slope we're on when we talk about Slide here. Um, oh yeah, it's fun. It, it is absolutely fun, but this is also like an unequivocally lame villain uh so uh you know like yeah what do you got dan (laughs) no i just think i think there's an art to being lame you know Mm -hmm. like there's a lot of lame villains but there's something about being so like unabashedly not cool that you kind of come back around again to being cool um there's like a physicality to slide that i like like i get how his powers work and i don't have to you know make it up in my brain about like, can he do this? Can he do that? No, he's slippery. And the way he <laughs> pings pong back and forth around the mall when he's fighting Spider-Man is fun. Uh, to me, it like we've all said it, it, it harkens back to the Ditko era. And like, yeah, if, if this came out in like the like 30 something issues of Ditko towards the end of his run, I would have a hundred percent believed or that slide yes. was drawn on a napkin somewhere that Dicko discarded and they found it yes. and we're like, let's bring this guy back in. Like that makes total sense to me. And then to add on to that, you know, like watching the Watchmen TV show, there's a character called Lube Man. Yes. And that is yes. slide. You can't tell me that that character was not inspired by slide and seeing him oh, in action. Yes. All I wanted was more Lube Man, and uh, you know, yeah, that's true. That on the guy. Watchmen, yes, I'm so glad you brought that up because uh, on the Watchmen show, which I admired but maybe did not enjoy, uh, Lube Man's insane cameo, which is not really revisited, just sort of out of nowhere. There's this slippery guy who slides into a <laughs> sewer grate and vanishes. I was just like, I remember I was watching the show. I was like, what? What was that? <laughs> who's who's that guy? <laughs> <laughs> and the costume is nearly identical to Slide's costume. Yeah. Like, there's yes. no way that it's not inspired by it in some way. Um, I don't know if Damon Lindelof is a fan of this comic. but um, or somebody in the writer's room or something. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really fun visual character. Slide is the perfect guy to show up in a Dan Slott comic and get beaten up by Spider-Man in the first three pages. You know, like, that's his, that's his role, and... You know, you need that kind of guy. So uh, count me in as a fan of Slide. So, Will, what what what, what would you give Slide as a, as a king. card? No, um, not a king. But, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him a... It sounds low, but I'm going to give him a six, and that's because, like, the maximum of, like, the role player that he is. Mm. Um, six of... Um, six of spades. Um, cause I haven't used it yet. <laughs> Nailed it. Uh, I have him as a six as well. Uh, I'd love to see him in the video game. Let's get him in the Spider-Man two video yes. game. I'd love to have a chase sequence with him. He does feel like a screwball level. Villain. Shocker maybe. Um, yeah, I like shocker too. I mean, I'd I put I, shocker. I, I like a lot slide, of these But anyway, I would put shocker above slide, but not way above. And I like <laughs> shocker a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, Slide's just, yeah, he's fun. Like, he fits. I I also think the spectacular Spider-Man cartoon that I really enjoyed a ton, Slide would fit very well in that cartoon. He wouldn't, like, that Spider-Man is a little less. His he, Since there's no Avengers and no Fantastic Four, he's got more sort of street-level characters. Slide would fit in that world really well for, like, a teenager to be fighting. I don't know. It's, slide works for me. Six sounds low, I agree, but uh, it's lower than Puma, so I don't know what that says. But I, I think because Puma has more potential and a great design. I don't know. I could be talked up to a seven, but I'm going to stick with a six. Five of diamonds because diamonds are shiny and kind of slippery. 
you well, know. He, yeah. I also had di- yeah. diamonds as well yeah. for me. So uh, I'm I'm giving him a six as well. I think that's the perfect place for someone who is cool in his not coolness. Um, you know, welcome welcome the return of, of Slide. Um, so from uh, one character to a team of characters, we've got the Sinister Syndicate. Uh, an equally kind of short-lived, I think, uh, team up. Mark, tell us a little bit about the Sinister Syndicate. Yeah, well, you know, they uh, are a kind of um, Marvel or, or the Falco Friends' answer to the uh, Sinister Six. Uh, they uh, consisted of Beetle, Rhino, Speed Demon, Hydra Man, Boomerang, and Beetle was the leader. They first appeared in Amazing Spider-Man number 280. Uh, you know, talking about memorable Silver Sable stories, this might have been one of them if you remembered it. It's Spider-Man and Silver <laughs> Sable uh, going against the Sinister Syndicate who are protecting Jason Massendale, another really memorable villain from this era. I don't know if we talk <laughs> about him per se, but we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, I think what is most interesting about Sinister Syndicate, uh, I am editorializing in my summary here, is that they uh, evolve. They become first the sinister foes of Spider-Man in the early 90s in a miniseries written by Danny Figueroff, uh, which then uh, evolved eventually into uh, the 2010s superior foes of Spider-Man, which was led by uh, Boomerang. Um and I would say that, like, every iteration of this super team became increasingly unserious um, in a hilarious way. Uh, any thoughts, though, on this version of the Syndicate? I like them. I think um, this is probably my introduction to the Beetle. I don't think I'd seen the Beetle before as a kid. Uh, uh, and I, the Beetle, I, I think, is a really cool looking. I mean, this is, I think, a John Byrne design. Mm-hmm. Look for the beetle. Um, certainly, he drew the first appearance of this costume. Um, so he, the beetle looks cool. I remember liking this team. That that mini series you're talking about, Mark. I remember f- liking uh, the, the sinister. What was it called? The sinister, sinister foes. foes? Spider Man. Yep. Uh, I remember liking. Was there two of those or there just one two. of those? Because then it became like. I remember yeah. liking both of those. I haven't reread them maybe since they've come out. So who knows if they're good? But I remember enjoying both of those. I. I it's one of the. It's a. This is a good example of like a. They're more than the sum of their parts. Like I don't really care about Speed Demon and Hydro Man is clearly just a Sandman, <laughs> uh, uh, like replacement. But the Mud Monster. Rhino's... No, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't need the Mud Monster. Rhino's pretty cool. Boomerang's kind of lame. He's not even as like cool as the Flash Boomerang. I like humorous Boomerang, but Boomerang as a serious villain doesn't do much for me. Uh, but I like this team. I like them as a team. I think it works well. They're, they're less interesting apart, so it works. I mean, I wouldn't want to see them again as this team because I like Beetle as a hero now, uh, Mach 1 or what, whatever number he's up to. Uh, but I like the Sinister Syndicate. I like them. I'm, I'm in favor of this team. Silly little duds, <laughs> and I don't need them the way they are now. Promoted up to jokes, I love it. But right as they are here, uh, keep next. Mm. I would just mm. say anything that led to one of my favorite series of comics, like of the modern era, has some cachet, but th- they're they're pretty duddy here in this one issue. Um, so we'll we'll we'll, mm. we'll take that into account for my grade. What about you, Dan? I'll say you know I am an unabashed fan of the Friends DeFalco run, and this issue is the one I always skip. Uh, wow. I just really think it's boring. I I I actually disagree with you, Kevin. I think together they are all less interesting, even Hydro Man. Um, wow. And you know we, this is the appearance of the the really redesigned Rhino costume, which I could do with less of. Yes, it's um, a bad costume. I just think this issue feels overstuffed and I just don't care about anybody's individual personalities in this. Um, I, I think you're right, Mark, it would go on to become something great, but um, I don't know that the idea truly began here for that. So um, yeah, I, I am, I'm not a fan of this. I'm going to get straight to my number. This is a two for me. I, I'm not a fan of the team. It's a two for me too. Two of clubs. Uh, I, quick rebuttal, and then I'll give my number. I just I feel like 
first, the superior foes also only bring two of these guys back. It feels like a completely different team just using the name. Sure. But uh, and Boomerang's a completely different character by that point. Um, Speed Demon's the only one who even resembles what he is in this issue. I think Speed Demon's boring. I think Hydro Man's boring. I think Boomerang at this time is boring. And so, like, I don't know. It, putting them together does something with them. And Beetle, as fun as he is, like, mostly had been used, like, sort of as, like, an Iron Man-ish type villain at this mm. point more. And he's not really – he's not good enough to be an Iron Man villain when it comes to guys in powered suits. So, like, he's better here. I like him as sort of a leader. I don't know. Well, I'm gonna, I'm way out line. I'm giving it a jack. Whoa. Jack of hearts, because I love him. Whoa. I mean, Whoa. You, were saying, you were saying you're out of line. I was like, well, he might be aligned with me. And I'm like, nope, no, he's not. He's not aligned with me. I, I'm giving them a six. I don't love this story. I, like, this story is probably a two or a three for me. But, like, I, 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 yeah, I, I agree I'm with that. grading what they would become. I mean, like, superior foes I would give a king or an ace even. Because, I, I mean, I love that that whole series that much. Um for those who don't think I like anything that Nick Spencer ever did on Spider-Man books. Um, but, um, yeah. I mean, I bought both those miniseries, and I think I bought it because these characters appealed yeah. to me, man. Uh, the team appealed to me. Again, the characters don't. A Hydra Man miniseries I wouldn't even look at. I mean, at. look, I'm still trying to find the Silver Sable fan, but at least I found the uh, Sinister <laughs> Syndicate fan. So we, we, we are there. We've, we've made it, Dan. We've done it. All right? It's over. Well, our next character is headed to the silver screen uh, in a, shoot, uh, a few short months. Uh, that is The Spot. Uh, Jonathan Own uh, first appeared in Spectacular 97, created by Al Milgram and Herb Trimpey. We're moving out of Ron Friends and Tom DeFalco's territory. Uh, Mark, tell us about The Spot. I mean, you know, famously based on the animal, the leopard, who is known for his spots. No, not at all. Like you said, was not created by the Falcon and Friends. Uh, the spot is Dr. Jonathan Own, an MIT scientist who tried to recreate Cloak's dark dimension, but instead had a radioactive accident, which adhered portals to his skin, turning him into the spot. I mean, and his powers, he can enter in and out of portals, Mainly been used as a punchline, but, you know, not for nothing, has had some success against Spider-Man and generally doesn't lose unless he kind of like, you know, is foisted on his own petard. Uh, he did go on to form the Spider-Man revenge squad known as the Legion of Losers with such luminaries as Gibbon, Kangaroo, Kangaroo and Grizzly, a.k.a. villains from the Jerry Conway villains episode, the, the bad, bad guys or whatever we did at that time. Um, he was also used in Superior Foes of Spider-Man, again, as a punchline and again was used by Nick Spencer as a way for Kingpin and Norman Osborn to trap Kindred during the last remain story. I know we always like to talk about Kindred and Last Remains on this podcast. And as you alluded to, Dan, he will be appearing in the new Across the Spider-Verse movie. And he will be voiced by Jason Schwartzman. Um, you know, love the movies that Jason Schwartzman has been in. Which, you know, I can't think of anyone. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Anyway, Dan, <laughs> Dan, Heinz Brothers, what do we think of The Spot? Well, really quickly, I'll say, like, I got invited to uh, the the behind the scenes of Across the Spider-Verse a number of years ago. In fact, probably about three years ago and um, was asked to kind of, like, throw out some villain ideas. And they told me that they were leaning heavily into featuring The Spot as the main villain. And I remember thinking at the time, what? Uh, that's <laughs> the guy? You know, like, maybe there's some logic there on, like portal usage and, and, and things like that and spider versing. And I, I, I had that with me for three years. So to see it on screen in the latest trailer, like they actually are doing this, they're going with the spot. Although I don't think he's been featured quite as heavily as they were suggesting back when I was talking with them. But um, yeah, I mean, I like the spot. I did not think he would be a big movie star. Like that would be low on my list. Um, but I've always felt like he was a character that had a lot more potential as a villain than what we ultimately got. And maybe that's just because his design is so silly looking. Uh, what say you, Heinz Brothers? His look is great. 
Uh, I think Alan Moore would do have a field day with this weird power of another dimension. Um, not his look isn't great. His look is intriguing. Let's say that it's not great. It's intriguing. Um, my only complaint of this is just too much. Too much real estate was spent on him. I think he's like foreshadowed in '96. Gets his powers in '97. Then it's '98, '99, and hundred. He's fighting them all in spectacular, and it's way, way too much. This is a one-issue villain kind of kind of fella. But uh, the visuals are pretty great, as the video game Portal has shown us. Putting a door one place and another door somewhere incongruous and being able to connect out of it is visually really interesting. Um, it's also used in the latest Dungeons and the latest, the only Dungeons and Dragons movie. There's a cool There's portal sequence. Um, more Dungeons and Dragons movies. Oh yeah, yeah. There's Those three ones other Marlon ones. Wayans. Yeah. Uh, I apologize is, to the to the Dungeons talking, and Dragons cinema the, world universe. The animated show from the '80s or no? No, there was a Marlon Wayans uh, one uh, that was. Real bad. <laughs> it had two even worse sequels. So, uh, yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. Keep going. Okay, but D and D movies aside, uh, there's no. a portal. There's a portal use in the recent D and D movie, and um, I don't know. I, 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 he's promising, and if if it was one issue and not four, um, I think I would have really interested. So it's one good issue spread out over four. For the character itself, I'm uh, optimistic. I, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, the story of the scientist, the little kind of like, you know, weaselly little scientist who's being ignored by Kingpin and kind of wants to be recognized, but it's kind of a rat coward. I like that, too. That's kind of a fun character. I have a fondness for the spot, and I think because it was when I was reading comics that he debuted. It was like the first one of these that I think there's too many of these, but it was the first of these characters that sort of showed up that was like immediately a joke. Like Spider-Man laughs when he first meets the spot. Just like, like buckles over, laughing at the character's name and his look, and he's just like, "You're pathetic." And there's a bunch of those, all probably in the Legion of Losers. And I think there's too many of them. I think Spider-Man doesn't need so many villains that are just sort of like easy to fight. And I think Spot could be powered up a little bit without actually powering him up. I think he could be used in a more interesting way. I think he was used in a Daredevil story by Mark Wade, in an mm, interesting way. Yeah, uh, I can't cool remember the story. details of it. Um. So I like the spot. Uh, uh, I don't love joke characters as a general rule, but I don't think the spot needs to be a complete joke. I like him maybe more than I should because of when he debuted for me. Um, and I don't even mind that it was like four issues of buildup. Like I remember as a kid being like, oh, what, what he's going to do with these powers? And he sort of shows up and he's immediately joke and then sort of wins and then gets his clock cleaned. Uh, I remember just being like, oh, I didn't, this was not how, where I thought this story was going. Um, maybe it wasn't where it was planned on going. I don't know. Maybe they didn't know. They might have been making it up as they went along. Um, but I enjoyed it as a kid, so I, I have trouble letting go of that. I don't like when he's a complete loser. I didn't love the Legion of Losers story. Uh, I mean, he does fit for, like, the, the su- superior foes, but uh, I, li- I like him more as something a little bit more than that. But I like him. I'm a fan. I gotta be. I gotta be honest here. I mean, like, I don't know if I'm like fool killer level of fan here, but like, I, I I will just say that, you know, for for all of the like, oh, he's a joke, he's a punchline, like, he's he's elusive, he's kind of hard to 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 beat for the most part. The way he's portrayed in these comics, um, I do feel that his abilities and his powers don't necessarily translate as well. Uh, to a static page as they might to a visual moving medium. So I will be very fascinated to see how it works into um, across the Spider-Verse. Um, but like, I, I think there's a lot of fun to be had here. I do like that while I, you know, he is a punchline, like it's very aware of the fact that it's kind of silly and absurd and that, that it's just comics, uh, you know, but like, it, but at the same time, it's just comics. But like, hey, like he very rarely gets beaten by Spider-Man clean. You know what I mean? Like he's moving around. So I, I, I like the spot. That's 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 the bottom line. I like the spot. I like the spot, too. I like that he's used as like a comedy character. Um, but I would love to see like someone play with the body horror elements of of the spot a bit more. Uh, Will, you were saying Alan Moore would have a field day and. 
I, I, I do think there is really something there um, in Mark Wade's Daredevil. There, you know, Daredevil's radar sense doesn't see the holes. It just perceives like emptiness in the spot. And so you can see his body kind of carved into um, with Daredevil's radar sense. And I've always held that visual of the spot in my my brain. And I would love to see someone explore like really doing something kind of disturbing with the spot. But as he is, I think he's a fun character. And I'm always kind of tickled when he shows up. Um, but no one's really done anything substantial with him. I don't really think in Spider-Man mythos since his origin, uh, story. So, um, I'm, I'm curious to see where it'll go. So Will, why don't we do a quick round Robin of reviews here? Just real quick. Let's imagine Alan Moore saying, I'm going to, I'm going to do comics again. I've changed my mind. I'm doing a six issue spot mini series. <laughs> wait, wait, do, do, it'd do, be do, incredible. Do you to, it would be incredible. You need me to do my Alan Moore voice. Yeah, let's hear Alan yeah, yeah, Moore. Let's hear Alan Moore. To... We need to do the six issue. I, I don't know how Alan Moore. He's like British, right? <laughs> <laughs> he is British, yes. Was that British? No, I don't know what it was. But... <laughs> it sounded like Goodfellas. Boy, yeah, still I was counting gonna, it. I was going to say, like, uh, that was like Colonel Kurtz. <laughs> still think we counted as one of his 1,000 yeah, voices. It counts. So. Put it up. He's not as way Put it on the board. Put it on the board. All Good right. lucky keep um, a counter in the corner. I give the spot a six. Uh, no, I'm doing seven. I give the spot a seven of diamonds. Ten. I'm wow. going high. I like the spot. Wow. I, I enjoy I enjoy him. I would be happy to see more done with him. Uh, I think there's potential there. He's fun. I like him. No no complaints. No notes. A ten of uh, a spades because the spot's I'm right there with oh, yeah. you. Ten of, ten of clubs, because I feel like uh, every one of those little uh, like circles at the end of a club is like one of his spots. I'm giving him a nine, but it's that card that some kid hole punched into, <laughs> and you'll ne- you'll never be able to not spot it in the deck. Um, so <laughs> anyway, uh, moving on from the spot to someone of a completely different emotional tone. Uh, it is the Sin Eater, uh, who first appeared in Spectacular Spider-Man. Number 107, created by Peter David and Rick Buck- Buckler. Um, Sin Eater, Mark, tell us a little bit about this guy. Yeah, he uh, it's uh, Stan Carter, who was a former S.H.I.E.L.D. agent turned NYPD detective. Um, he, uh, during his S.H.I.E.L.D. days, received a version of, like, not the super serum, but like a, like a, a shot of some sort that enhanced his strength and endurance. Um, but you know that program was eventually discontinued, and of course, kind of left him uh, somewhat uh, emotionally abandoned. And you know, whenever you do that to a character, he becomes very unhinged and kind of crazy. And in this case, he uh, he was on the NYPD. His partner was killed, uh, and he became the Sin Eater, which means that he uh, murdered anyone who sinned uh, by abusing their authority. Um, this was, of course, part of. Um, the Peter David run on Spectacular Spider-Man, which was meant to kind of bring a darker, more grittier tone uh, to Spider-Man comics. You know, when the when each of the different uh, books was kind of having their own persona. Uh, you know, probably one of the most famous Spider-Man stories of all time: the Sin Eater kills Detective Gene DeWolf. Um, then uh, that that storyline was uh, further utilized during the DeFalco Friends run. I think it was during was it the the Mephisto issue or one of them where where Peter is kind of like reliving his traumas and he talks about when he like jumps up and over a shotgun blast from the seed eater and kills uh, an innocent person behind him. Uh, you know, this is kind of uh, for all you Dan Slot Run fans. This is Proto Massacre, aka a soulless killer who uh, kind of challenged Spider Man's uh, version of morality and how do you approach someone who just has no filter to just kill and destroy. Um, he would return uh, a few years later in another Peter David story on Spectacular. Um, at this point, he's kind of broken down because he's been, he was beaten so badly, uh, physically beaten so badly by Spider-Man during that uh, initial Gene DeWolf story. Um, and he kind of ends that story by going down in a hail of gunfire uh, because he, he's just goading the police officers just to kind of free him from the persona of the Sin Eater. Uh, and then we really would never see him again until uh, Nick Spencer was like, no, no, 
no, I need to retcon this man's story because I need to fix it. Um, and he brings the Sin Eater back uh, as a henchman of Kindred who cleans villains of their sins, most notably Norman Osborn. Uh, and now apparently Norman Osborn is a good guy. So the Sin Eater's work is like really all over the place and, you know, is all part of like ending the marriage. So I'm pro Sin Eater, right? No. Anyway, what, what do we all think <laughs> of the Sin Eater? I mean, he's one of the great ones. This is one of the great stories of all time. I, I, he terrified me as when I first read him, and it's still kind of gruesome. Little, little, little bit is dimmed in retrospect because it's such a cliche for the, for this time in comics to up the violence. It's a little bit of a, you know, looking back, it's like everybody was doing it sort of thing. But it is, it was effective. Like Gene DeWolf, a character I maybe was not that invested in her death resonated with me for a long time and the sin eater scared the pants off of me and uh it really affected me so i gotta give props to an effective story even if it's a bummer one so yeah big i don't know really strong villain yeah i like the sin eater too it like thinking of, i mean he's like again like a character like is there much to him as a character not really but unlike manslaughter marsdale he is essential to this story like you need a character like this he serves a purpose really well do i need more sin eater stories no i didn't even need that second one that peter david did probably uh, though i will say that taking the name sin eater nick spencer's take on that name in isolation if like sin eater didn't already exist i'm like that's a cool take sounds like a great ghost rider character uh i didn't care about uh that in the run of Spencer's run personally, but uh, I like that take. But this story in and of itself is great. Sin Eater works really great. I think it's it's hard to complain about any f faults in this. It's also elevated the Spider-Man Daredevil relationship. Uh, that's not Sin Eater doing that, but he's a part of it. It's all tied into to each other. It's This is one of those high watermarks. As a kid, I was reading this being like, well, this is a... Like, I'd been reading all these stories like, this is good. I loved... Hey, I love the uh, uh, Sinister Syndicate, and then this came along, and I'm like, oh, man, look at this. So, a, a real comparison there. The Sinister but, you know, it's just like, oh, I like this, I'm nine, and this is a really fun story. And then I read this, I'm like, oh, like having those stories that sort of open your eyes and be like, totally. oh, you can do even more. Uh, you don't know that until you read them. This is This is one of those stories where I kind of have to separate, like, my fandom from my uh, – criticism side because like as a as a fan i don't love how dark this is within the realm of spider-man you know will you kind of refer to it like you know i feel like if you, especially if you look at other books from this era everyone was kind of doing this it's kind of like i call it like it's like frank miller does spider-man even though yeah. it's not frank miller yeah. it's peter david doing it um so but that aside like it's influence and just like just its impact on 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 the medium and on Spider-Man comics specifically is so undeniable. And like, if I kind of like remove my own personal aesthetic and taste for it, it's like you know having this villain, this kind of like just soulless, you know, you know, scheme-ask villain come in and 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 just wreak the havoc on Spider-Man's universe the way he did is really just such a wonderful adversary for Spider-Man because like he, he has not really dealt with anything quite like that before uh, to this point. Like, you know, it's always, you know, for Spider-Man, it's always been about like the personal angle, um, whether it be, you know, Norman or, or, or Doc Ock or anything like that. And this is just like, no, it's not personal. This, this person is just pure evil uh, and, and is willing to just drag you into those depths with him uh, to stop him because there's no other way to do it. Uh, and, 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 you know, in retrospect, it really is so well done how they kind of just resolve all this and kind of, you know, show Peter's own dark side and how this character kind of brought that out. So like, it's, it's, it's very impactful. I hate how this character was brought back in the Nick Spencer run, if that did not come out in my synopsis and talking about it, it's just like, like <laughs> leave well enough alone. I did like the return of the Sin Eater storyline that Peter David did, um, but more so because of how it elevated Electro. I kind of liked how like Electro kind of like, who always kind of been like a, like a very underrated punchline in the Spider-Man rogues gallery, despite the fact that he's one of like the original, like Sinister Six and all that. Like he really, I didn't feel had a lot of good stories, but I felt this like, this was one of the first truly great Electro stories. Um, 
uh, when when Sin Eater came back. But but yeah, I'm I'm a I if you couldn't tell, I'm a huge uh, fan of the Sin Eater and his impact on Spider Man comics. Dan, what do you got? You know, I'm actually not a big fan of the Sin Eater and his impact on Spider Man comics. To just take the the other point, um, like I can acknowledge its uh, its importance and 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 its kind of groundbreaking nature. But I think this kind of, you know, it's hard to separate from what would come later because I think so many of the comics of the 90s became so deeply tortured and psychological that it removed a lot of the fun from Spider-Man comics. And that's not this character's fault, but I can see this story's impact as kind of leading to a lot of that stuff that really kind of turned me off from from uh, reading the character um, and Anytime Spider-Man goes so deeply psychological, it does kind of lose some of the charm that brought me to it in the first place. Um, I like the story just fine, um, and I like the character of the Sin Eater, and I, I'll be honest, I especially like that second story even more than the death of Gene DeWolf, um, if only because it puts Spider-Man in a position I don't normally see him in, which is... Um, having to argue on the behalf of someone being a reformed villain um, that no one else believes in, um, that they can become a better person or they can uh, relinquish their dark history. Um, and, you know, the, it creates a really tragic ending with, uh, you know, the Sin Eater walking out and, and going death by cop. And uh, I find that a really interesting position for Spider-Man to be in, arguing on behalf of, of someone becoming a better person or relinquishing themselves as a villain. And um, I can't say I've seen that story really done um, anywhere else other than that sequel to the first Sin Eater story. So um, I think there's a lot of good things about Sin Eater as a character, but it's just a realm of comic that is not my favorite in the Spider-Man oeuvre, if you will. So um, that's my two cents on it. And I know Mark and I are going to have a lot more to say about this because we're doing an episode just on the death of, of Gene DeWolf later in the season. So um, it will be interesting to kind of follow up on that and, and research the origins of that comic. So um, if anybody wants to rebut me or get into grades, we'll, we'll go down to Will. Jack. Of spades, because <laughs> it feels like death. I'm giving him a nine of diamonds just because I don't – I'm still kind of going in this trend of like, oh, what I want to see Sin Eater back. And I don't ever want more Sin Eater stories. I wouldn't even want like a nostalgia. Uh, uh, here's an untold Sin Eater story. It's like I don't need any more Sin Eater stories. So as a character, he serves a story so much. But I, the story is so good that there's it ends up as a nine of diamonds because it's, it's worth a lot to me. I see that. I'm going to say queen of hearts and you know, he would be a queen and probably be like, that's a sin and I'm going to kill it anyway. anyway <laughs> you, you go Dan. I, I, I'm sensing a real like fool killer comparison here, right? Both of these are villains that like uh, determine whether or not someone fits their criteria to die. Um, but uh, you know, I, and I can understand Mark that you have a real thing for that kind of villain um, uh, to me Trying to get us to turn on you. <laughs> to me, he's like a nine. Yeah, I don't think there's anything especially uh, special about him as like a character in it per se, but he's used in interesting stories. So um, that elevates him for me. And I had nine of clubs just to Dan keep Dan and I both moving. gave him nines, but I would say Dan sounded so much more negative and I sounded so much more positive. We both ended up with the same number. <laughs> yeah, I don't Very know. It's, it's that time of night, I, I guess. Uh, yeah. No, I get it. Well, hey, guys. Uh, I, if, I, I, if you think I'm sounding negative now, wait till we talk about this next guy. Uh, it is <laughs> The Foreigner, um, another it creation of Peter like David. It feels like the first time. Sorry. <laughs> Stop, Mark. We, we can't afford it. We can't afford it. Uh, um, especially with that spot-on impression. That's another voice for you guys, by the way. Um, <laughs> Mark Peter, it. Peter David's Foreigner, uh, first appearance in Spectacular 116, Mark, tell us about the foreigner, and I say that like sincerely. 
who is this guy? Because I don't care about him at all. I mean, he's as cold as ice, willing to sacrifice your love. He was an immediate <laughs> oh favorite gosh. of Spider Office editor Chib Owsley, a.k.a. Christopher Priest, a.k.a. I didn't kill Ned Leeds. Wait, I did. Anyway, he wanted to actually use the foreigner as the hobgoblin. And Peter David was like, wait, what? Uh, I mean, literal <laughs> reaction there. Um, instead, he uh, it was written that uh, Jason Massendale hired the foreigner to kill Ned Leeds as the hobgoblin. So Massendale could assume the mantle of hobgoblin. You know, that old chestnut. Um you know, the foreigner, he's he's a mercenary. He's another, you know, hired gun. I'm going to, you know, give me my money and I'm going to kill you. He's got a consortium of assassins called the 1400 Club. Uh, cool. Uh, he gets embroiled in the gang war with the Rose and the Kingpin. He trained Sabretooth, apparently. Uh, and uh, now he had a quick romance of Black Cat, but that was before... Uh, he just fell for that silver sable, uh, and now they're back together again. Uh, he also apparently appeared in Sinister War as a henchman of Kindred. I don't remember that, Dan, but I'm sure it was a great story, as the internet wants me to believe. What do we want to say about the foreigner? Nothing. I just He's I a have dud. No, I have no opinion on this character. I like. I'm every time the name appears is the first time I know of his existence. Yeah, I was just going to say, I read these comics. I had no memory of him. He's just like a spy? Assassin. I don't know. I had I had no memory. I definitely have read these comics. I have no memory of the foreigner. He had made no impact on me. Same here. Um, so He's a big dud. dud. He's, a, he's the duddest of the duds. He's the biggest dud of this, yeah. He's the new fool killer. He is like, uh, he is below two. He's the duddiest he's, dud. He, he, he's just yeah. so empty. He's just so empty. There's like nothing specific. He's like a he's like a daffodil that's been blown out over a lawn. That sounds interesting. He wants to know what love is. And <laughs> <laughs> you mean a dandelion, Will? <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. When, oh, when you burn. when your like highest accomplishment <laughs> is to kill uh, Ned Leeds in a mistake, <laughs> you know, like uh, n- not great, not great. So the foreigner, I think we're all saying an absolute dud. Yeah. Yes. Yes. If if you could use the ace as a one, like uh, sometimes you can, it can be both the high and the low card. It would be the low ace. But if not, a, a negative two, whatever. He's, that. A, su- he's a sub two. Okay, great. I I think I have the approval to move on to the exact opposite of the foreigner, which is to say a character or thing that has become ubiquitous with the Marvel line. And I think we would probably all argue like you could definitely tone it down a bit, Marvel, except I'm sure it (laughs) sells a lot of comics. And that is the first appearance of the symbiote in this run. I dare say it's even a full villain in this run. Uh, First appearing in Amazing Spider-Man 252. Obviously, its origins were explained in Secret Wars number eight. Uh, Depending on, like, you know, who you are, its first appearance could oscillate between the two. Um, Mark, tell us a little bit, heaven help us, about the symbiote. Is it symbiote or symbiote, Dan? That is the question. Uh, Of course, beyond that, the other question is, What's the deal with the symbiote? Apparently, Roger Stern was the one who uh, said when they were kind of uh, kicking around this idea for uh, Spider-Man having a new costume, that the new costume should be alive. Uh, And, you know, Roger Stern, of course, the brilliant person that he is, uh, came up with a million dollar idea here or maybe billion dollar, depending on your look of how cash flows. Anyway, uh, the suit is shown, of course, as being alive, the new black suit, uh, over the course of Amazing Spider-Man 252 to 258, but uh, its more malicious motivations aren't really revealed into, until uh, Amazing Spider-Man number 258. That's when the Fantastic Four, of course, discovered that the costume is a symbiotic host, in spi- uh, or, or that Spider-Man is the host, uh, and that this is like a parasite, that and it wants to take it over, so they remove it, 
with some Sonics and Fire, which, you know, put a pin in that one, uh, all you Marvel fans. Uh, then the, char- the, the the costume or the, the alien uh, would reappear in Web of Spider-Man number one as an antagonist uh, trying to get revenge on Spider-Man. And, of course, uh, we will be talking about Web of Spider-Man and the start of that series uh, later on in the series. Um, you know, famously, the symbiote uh, or symbiote, whatever you want to call it, uh, bonds to... A reporter named Eddie Brock, who is disgraced for faking a news story about the identity of the da-da-da-da, the Sin Eater. Uh, So, of course, there is a mutual hatred there for Peter Parker, and that leads to a character named Venom. And then we would never hear of the symbiotes (laughs) again. Um, And that's it. I mean, you know. I mean, talk about a short-lived uh, fantasy there, right? No, of course. <laughs> um, it's like, you know, I got a, a, a subs- uh, subscriber list from my local comic book shop for this Wednesday's releases. Uh, of course, you know, when you all hear this, it'll be like like maybe four or five Wednesdays ago. But I will just say that there are like seven stories with symbiote characters uh, coming out on Wednesday, uh, including like four with Carnage. Uh, so anyway... What do we want to say about the symbiote? He's great. Uh, I love the symbiote. Uh, I I don't. I, I like Venom a lot, and I don't really like any of the symbiote stuff beyond that Carnage. Or uh, even though there's been some good stories with all these characters, Red Goblin that's going on now, and and so many other things. There's too much symbiotes. Venom was great, but even divorced from Venom, and I think Venom is such a great Spider-Man villain. Even the symbiote alone is so great. Again, I always remember reading this as a kid, like watching Peter Parker sort of waste away as the suit is sort of like exhausting him all the time. And you know something's up before you even know it's wearing him at night. It's It was really intriguing and interesting. And then when it came back in Web of uh, Spider-Man 1, I was like, that blew me away. That was sort of a very cool sequence, making the Vulturions uh, – valid foes because you had to fight his costume at the same time. I was like, this is just like a really fun, cool... That was issue one, right, yep. Web? Uh, yeah. It was just like a really cool storyline that I thought was really fun and really exciting and it made that symbiote seem uh, like something that would recur and keep happening. And I think Venom elevated that even more. But even in isolation, I think it's an awesome, awesome villain. Uh, yeah, I Kevin, I agree with you. Like, what's... Venom, obviously, top tier Spider Man villain, the only, you know, number one of the non Ditko villains, uh, pretty uh, uh, strikingly. But um, it's interesting that even before it's Venom, this is like a really compelling story. Uh, I mean, I'm haunted by the thoughts of the th- costume slithering around in Parker's apartment at night and taking him swinging. Uh, it's interesting that this costume is a hit in every way. Just when it was a look, people liked it. When it was a living thing, but a positive, get you know, gadget, it was sort of intriguing. Then, as the, you know, like you're saying, Kevin divorced of Venom just as a villain, he was intriguing as Venom. It's the most, one of the most popular villains in Marvel history, and then of course all of the offshoots and reboots and uh, descendants of it are you know, if not good, at least are always compelling and have some popularity. Like, the appeal of this character is huge. Um, and these stories still work on me. The The costume scared me as I read these issues again for this it, episode. It's very rare to have something come this late, like in Marvel's history, and have this much impact, right? I mean... And also to generally, be, you're just mining the old stuff so much. Exactly, and it's also a product of committee. You know, like it just sounded like okay, it was Roger Stern's idea for it to be alive, but obviously he could not foresee what would happen with this character. Um, it seemed like a lot of different people sort of pitched in on the ideas to move it along, and they all helped. It's remarkable. Which is, I, I think, frankly, very odd. Uh, In a good way, you know what I mean? Like, you don't normally hear about having too many cooks in the kitchen and having... And it working. And it working. And and this is probably, uh, it might be the the one and only case where, at least in Spider-Man realm, that it worked. It's the Casablanca of villains, right? That was sort of a committee (laughs) movie. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's great. Right, Dan? You like movies? (laughs) Yes. uh, I I understood that reference. (laughs) There you go. Thanks. Good. That was more just me making sure I made that reference correct. Go on, Mark. I, I, I mean, look, I mean, this, 
there, there's nothing much else to add to what's already been said here. I mean, I will say, and I talked about this a bit uh, in some of our previous episodes, the season, Dan, which is um, like I, I kind of view 252 to 258 is almost kind of like a mini re redone origin but like kind of like the origin of like bronze age spider-man in a way you know and and because so much of that is like you know it's 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 spider-man kind of coming to terms with these new powers and these new abilities and the responsibilities that come with them and i think like using like the suit as a living entity and av and then eventual adversary is the perfect way of showing that i mean like you know this is this is just magic happening as it does it's probably one of the most important creations um again post dicko that we have related to this character so much of my love of spider-man is associated with the symbiote uh and and the mystery behind that and the the intrigue of how it works it's like the perfect upgrade for spider-man the the a character that's really obsessed with mechanics and suddenly you have an alien thing that you know nothing about and exploring the mechanics of that and eventually all of the backstory which is more confusing than i even dare recount here but yet somehow it always remains a fertile ground for new ideas uh to springboard from whether you like them all or or not um i think the symbiote is you know it's just perfectly encapsulated as this like pool of blackness it just invites questions and mystery and uh, you know, you just want to know more about it. And that continues, whatever, 30 f years later, uh, you know, uh, from its first appearance. Uh, I think the symbiote is one of the greatest ideas to come to Spider-Man lore, um, you know, for all the good and bad of it. So, uh, yeah, g thumbs up on the symbiote. Just to add one more thing, like rereading these issues, like uh, the Every time Spider-Man would think like, oh, I should go to Reed Richards and get the suit checked out. Like as a kid, that would just read like, oh, you're reminding me of this plot point. And now I'm reading it. I'm like, it feels like a horror story where I'm like, yes, go. <laughs> Why are, are you, you putting waiting it for it? So it makes it makes sense in story wise putting it off. His life is always so chaotic. But like in reread, now I know what this thing is. I'm just like, oh, it, it, it haunts you a little bit, even if I don't know how much they knew. What when they first started seeding him, like, oh, I should talk to Reed about this, what that even meant at the time. Uh, it was just really great. All right, well, let's get some grades on this final one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's no, no slime slaughter, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, an ace, you know, uh, no, if there ever was going to be an ace for a villain, this is it. I guess you could say King, only because it's not one of the OG, like, Doc Ock, Green Goblins, but I, I got to say, I, I even respect it more because it's not one of the OGs and it transcended. It's the ace. I have it as a king. I feel like with Venom, it's an ace, but uh, alone, I see. merely I see. merely a king, a king of spades. I see what you mean. Uh, you, you took the word. I, I will not change mine. You, you took the words out of my mouth, Kevin. King of spades for me. I'm going to go flat high ace. Uh, really love the symbiote. So I'm with you, Will. It's a good hand. Two aces, two kings. We're going to win. Great, great. Well, I think this podcast has been a win. It's a long show, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. And uh, I enjoyed actually, having you actually, guys back Actually, can I interrupt? On. Yeah. I'm sorry, Dan. Can I interrupt? The winning hand is actually the foreigner. Four of a kind. <laughs> four twos. That's the best hand we had. So the foreigner is the best villain. <laughs> Cumulatively, sorry, uh, I don't agree with it, but that's how it works. Well, we established that I don't know the rules of poker terribly well. So, uh, <laughs> Kevin, you are my guide, and uh, and, I, and I will put my full trust in in you. How so, could an ace um, be higher than a two? I don't know, Dan. Why don't you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's to say I really don't like the symbiote. That's why I gave it an ace. Uh, no, but uh, Mark, why don't you take us home? It is that time, time for all good things to come to an end, uh, including all of my many voices. So we want to say thank you to you, the listeners and viewers, for tuning in to this episode of The Amazing Spider Talk. But before we sign off, we want to thank Will and Kevin Hines for joining us again for another episode of The Bad Guys. 
Kevin and Will, where can we find our listeners? Wait, where can we find our listeners? Wait, rephrase that. I have a list of their addresses. <laughs> rephrase that. Well, they, yeah. they, maybe the listeners know where to find Dan and send him uh, creepy paraphernalia. But also, Kevin and Will, <laughs> where can our listeners find you on the World Wide uh, our, Web? Our, our podcast is called Screw It. We're just going to talk about comics. It's most places. Um, um and so, you know, that you find podcasts, check it out. You can go to – you can review us on Apple Podcasts where there is an insane running gag that people pretend we only talk about pasta recipes. Find out more about that mm-hmm. if you want to go look at our reviews. But um, – What's your – And guys, thanks. We just want to – What's, your, carb- what's, what, what's your carbonara recipe? I mean, you know. You have to listen to the podcast. All right, all right, right. <laughs> we can't spoil right, it here. Yeah. Uh, we've covered some Spider-Man stuff, if that's interesting to you. We've covered the Ditko stuff. We've covered Secret Wars, and we've covered Superior Spider-Man, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, as well as a few smatterings of other stuff. We're about to cover Brubaker's Catwoman. That's coming up soon, or maybe it's just come out, depending on when this is released, somewhere in that range. Uh, and, um, yeah, thank you guys for having us on the podcast. I'm a huge fan of you guys and the podcast. Me too. Uh, it's flattering to get to be on even more than once. Exactly. We we really appreciate being return guests. We're sorry the episode was so long. Sorry, listeners. But uh, you guys put on such a great show. You're so knowledgeable and nice and friendly and funny. You know, we don't know what we're doing, and we like to come <laughs> on here and see what people who know what they're doing, how they do it. So thanks for having Why, us. We learn are you apologizing well, to that's them? Very kind Apologize of you. to and me. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve it. Well, that's very kind of you, and I'm about to ruin all of that goodwill by saying, you know, it's the end of the episode. Mark was supposed to get to a thousand voices, and I think we maybe got ten. So, do we want to do a speed <laughs> round here, Mark? Oh God, no, no, no! I've only had one beer tonight, Dan. I don't think that's worth it. <laughs> well, tune into our Patreon for that content, then. Uh, yes, because this podcast exists because of our listener support on Patreon. For only $3.99 a month, you can help support our show's existence while getting early episodes, including these special seasonal episodes early, exclusive artwork, and a ton of other bonuses. So a thank you to everyone who supports us and the work that we do. And how else to, to thank them than give them an episode with 990 voices from Mark to make up for the difference? Absolutely, Dan. And also, to download our earliest episodes, including uh, my complete run of The Hits of Foreigner and interviews with legendary creators like <laughs> J.N. Demetrius, Tom DeFalco, Ron Friends, Mark Bagley, and more, subscribe to our amazing Spider Talk Back Issues podcast on Apple Podcasts. I would say it's urgent. Emergency. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> Dan, it's like, I don't understand that reference. (laughs) Yeah, no, the millennial energy going on over here. So, Mark, until you and I both don silver outfits, you as Silver Sable, me as Slide, and form the sinister Silver Syndicate, what's our motto? With great podcasts, there must also come in Spider Talk.